It's been a crazy week. We have this story out of Maryland and Portland where pregnancy centers, they're, they're uh, centers for helping women who are pregnant and are you know having uh, doubts or having issues or need support. Because they're pro-life, they've been ransacked by pro-abortion activists. And uh, man, the violence and the uh, just the the anger, it just keeps getting it keeps getting worse. I feel like people are becoming more absolute in their positions and unwilling to compromise. I think most people probably can see that as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Another element of the story is that these activists, um, a different group of activists or a similar activist group, published the addresses of several Supreme Court justices because they're upset about the leaked draft on Roe v. Wade. Jen Psaki essentially said Joe Biden doesn't care, that they don't care that, that it's happening. And also, uh, Joe Biden has uh, no position on abortion, restric uh, abortion restrictions. I said abortion. Abortion restrictions. So you've got now, uh, I think Tim Ryan in Ohio said abortion, no restrictions, none of our business. And that's where it is. Everything's becoming more and more extreme. Now, my view of it is the right seems to be exactly where they've been. They've always wanted to ban abortion. The left now wants to remove restrictions, which is more to the left of or more extreme than they've ever been. So we'll talk about that, too. And then in that. In, in, in line with that, and the other big news from the past week or so, Elon Musk, Tesla has announced they will cover the costs of women to travel out of state to get abortions, which somehow involves Elon Musk again. So we're going to talk about censorship. Elon Musk, uh, there's a story where apparently they're claiming Trump told Elon Musk to buy Twitter. He's denying it. So we're going to talk about this censorship. Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course, won her court case. She is eligible to run for re-election. But I think the big conversation tonight, tonight is going to be hyperpolarization ways to deal with it, ways to connect with people. And joining us to discuss this, and probably one of the foremost experts, is Daryl Davis. Good afternoon. How are you? I am fantastic. Do you want to introduce yourself? I think you just did. My name is Daryl Davis. I'm a 64-year-old musician, author, and lecturer, and race reconciliator. Hmm. Right on. You are, you, uh, I guess you're, you're the big story around you, aside from the fact that you're a famous jazz musician, is that you actually de-radicalized Klan members. Well, I inspire them to de to uh, de-radicalize themselves. I have been the impetus. You know, a lot of the media says, you know, black, you know, black blues musician or black rock and roll musician uh, converts X number of Klansmen. No, I never converted anybody. I have been the impetus for over 200 to convert themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, this is going to be fascinating because we talk about polarization a lot. And we actually did an event with you, which right. was really interesting. And it's going to be fun to talk about and, and kind of understand what happened there. But uh, also, we have Bill Ottman of Minds, who uh, can hey. also talk about you guys are working together on censorship and how censorship is making things worse. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm Bill. I'm a founder of Minds, Minds.com. Check it out. Daryl and I just recently uh, published a paper together with multiple PhDs and a bunch of researchers called The Censorship Effect, talking about the blowback of censorship, how to facilitate dialogue. And, you know, that's that's what we need more of. Right on. Yeah, man, I'm down to talk about censorship because I do believe a little bit of censorship is necessary. Otherwise, you have a wild zoo of people eating each other. So you've got to kind of you got to create a little bit of uh, a just just sensorial atmosphere, in my opinion. Well, Maybe we can talk about that later. Well, well just to add to that Dude. point real quick, <clears throat> some content is illegal. Mm. Of course. Child abuse. It's got to be censored. Mm -hmm. And that means Spam. someone goes in, has to remove it. Yeah. Right. Dude, well, Daryl. Oh, I, well, I just want to point out that you rocked with Chuck Berry. I didn't know for thirty-seven. You said thirty-seven. Thirty-two years. Thirty-two years. Wow. Made keys with Chuck. I mean, I he, played keys. he's credited with like inventing rock and roll. Right? He did invent rock. So and you roll. kind of invented <laughs> rock and roll. With him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I came long after. Johnny Johnson was his original piano player. I was born in nineteen fifty-eight, so right at the you know peak of uh, of rock and roll. That is hot. Thanks for so coming, cool. brother. All right. You guys want to get started? Well, we got Lydia. Lydia. Yeah, I am technically here as well. I just wanted to say, too, we were late getting up to the studio today because all of us who are supposed to do the sound check were so enthralled by what Daryl was telling us. So I'm really looking forward to this evening's conversation. I know the chat likes to laugh at me for being excited about my guests, but I'm excited about this conversation for sure. It's going to be great. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member if you would like to help support our work. Not only are you helping us with our uh, keeping our journalists employed, and we just brought on another really amazing, talented personality to contribute to uh, 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 our columns. I suppose now that she has articles up, it's uh, Josie, the redheaded libertarian on Twitter, is going to be writing uh, articles and commentary for us. She's absolutely fantastic, so I'm thrilled that she was able to to come and work with us. And it's thanks to you guys as members that make all that possible. So we'll do more. As a member, you'll, you'll, as a member, you will get access to exclusive segments from Timcast IRL Monday through Thursday at 8 p.m. We had a really fascinating 
members only episode last night where I got really mad about our own website because I take this stuff seriously. I fact check our fact checked our own site, called it out. And uh, because transparency is important as well. When we make mistakes, I will I will freak out and call it out because uh, I think I owe you guys. If you're members, we got to make sure we are better than everybody else when it comes to getting the facts straight. So don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Let's get started with this first story. I'm going to start here, actually, and not necessarily jump in with the violent photos, but this is part of the same story. White House refuses to condemn activist group who posted home addresses of Supreme Court justices. We have another story out of Maryland and Portland, and there are these pregnancy centers where activists went and smashed up the windows and damaged them, ransacked them. These are places where they try and talk to women who are pregnant. They're called uh, crisis pregnancy centers. Well, activists who are associated with the pro-abortion side of things, I guess, just hate them. And so they went and vandalized and tagged them up. I think seeing stuff like this reach the highest levels, like the White House, where we learned that Supreme Court justices had their addresses posted. We've already seen people lose their lives. It shows that we're reaching this very extreme level of hyperpolarization. So, uh, Daryl, I don't know if you've been following any of the current news about the Roe v. Wade stuff. I mean, things have been kind of crazy over the past couple of years or, you know, Bill, if you've been following this stuff. But uh, I, I think we just get started with this, the, the, the modern uh, uh, hyperpolarization. And I'm curious what your thoughts are with, you know, far left, as they would call it, or far right people fighting in the streets. Or how, how about just this right here, you know, pro-abortion groups smashing up windows and vandalizing buildings? Well, you know, that's been going on for quite some time. Um, about probably 30 years ago, there was an anti-abortion person uh, who was going up and down the East Coast uh, bombing abortion clinics. And uh, he got arrested, I think, down in Florida. Another one uh, murdered an abortion doctor in, in uh, Florida, Dr. Gunn. Uh, the, the guy who, um, who bombed the clinics lived, lived right in Maryland. And um, I remember <clears throat> I was in bed one night uh, at my girlfriend's house and there was thunder and lightning, and she lived right up against the woods. And we thought a, uh, a tree had been hit by lightning because the whole ground rocked, the things fell off the walls, everything, four o'clock in the morning, and uh, we jumped up out of bed, and then, um, you know, still thunder and lightning and raining outside. So at 7.30 that morning, things had died down, we came outside, all the neighbors were out, we're all looking in the woods for this uh, fallen tree, and um, this was on a Sunday morning, about 4 a.m. It wasn't discovered until Monday in Annapolis, Maryland, that uh, that guy had bombed the abortion clinic on the other side of the woods. Wow. How yeah. far away from your house was it? Uh, from her house. From it her was, house. Um, gosh, less than a quarter mile. That's wild. Yeah. It, it feels like there are political issues that are kind of impossible in a sense, like when we talk with people who are pro-life, because we have, you know, Seamus on the show periodically and we have a lot of conservatives and they're staunchly pro-life. Their view of this is, for one, most reasonable people, most most people, and particularly like all reasonable people, think bombing an abortion clinic is wrong and killing people is wrong. But you have, you have moral questions that arise if the pro-life side, side genuinely believes that babies are being murdered, then they're trying to stop murder. Now, how do you how do you how do you solve for a problem like that if you can't convince someone that it's wrong to bomb a, a clinic? You know what I mean? Like if they if they believe in their heart of hearts that they're saving babies, I don't I don't know if you can convince them not to commit these these acts. Well, I think, you know, that if they they're convinced that you're murdering babies and perhaps they're you know, they're not they're separating babies from adults. So in their minds, I'm not I'm not agreeing with them, I'm saying. But in their minds, they're murdering the people who are murdering babies. Right. So therefore, they're preventing the murder of babies. Or of just destroying. That's, that's their justification. Right. It's like, this is where things are getting interesting because we talked about this yesterday. Louisiana has advanced a bill that will make abortion homicide, that will legally list it as homicide. So this is, I mean, this is a political line that is as hard as a line can be. Because once that line is crossed, that means... You have serious questions about whether or not someone is justified in using force to stop an abortion doctor from committing an abortion. If the act of abortion is homicide, then there's a legal justification to prevent that from happening. That's if it's codified. Regardless of the law, though, there are people who already believe that to be the case. I thought the conversation you guys had down in Nashville sort of theorizing about future technology 
that could potentially enable a fetus to live at a much earlier age. Like that is a fascinating philosophical right. conversation that I think people just need to be willing to have because, but because that is what it puts it into context, it makes it less emotional. Well, the fascinating thing is uh, we had this conversation where I, I basically asked if there was a way that from the moment of conception, a baby could be taken from the womb and put into an artificial womb, a machine that would allows it, allow it to live. Should we then ban abortion uh, to the extent that the baby is killed and only allow procedures to terminate a pregnancy if the pregnancy, if the baby is allowed to survive? The, the issue with that, I suppose, is everyone on the right basically says like, oh, OK, that's an interesting question. Maybe separating from the mother might be bad. But I've asked a handful of people on the left and they say, meh, who cares? No, I don't know. Why not? Whatever. So I, not, not to get into a technological discussion. Right. My question, I guess, is I'm trying to get what I'm trying to get into is, are there issues we can't mend? Are, are, there, are there are there you know just ideas that we're never going to be able to to rectify amongst? Each I other? believe I believe so. I mean you know we can come close, but there are always going to be issues that that will crop up, and then you know you have uh, what you just proposed there as a possible viable solution. But when you have things that are that extreme on the right, that extreme on the left, you know you're not going to change those people necessarily. But what you can do is uplift the middle. When you have that extreme polarization then what you want to do is strengthen the middle, pull the middle up. And in doing so, you will pull some of those uh, people on the left and some of those people on the right into the middle as you do that, sort of like a vortex. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, have, have you heard the, the idea that socialism is able to exist within libertarianism, but libertarianism is not able to exist within socialism? Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's a pretty powerful idea. I, I mean, I don't, necessarily know one way or the other if it's true but it seems like it seems like a true fact what do you guys think about that idea in a fully oh, libertarian yeah. system you have the right to create a socialized system with no problems in a fully socialized system you've got a lot of checks and balances you'd have to get through to create a system where you're like i don't want to be a part of that unfortunately you have to because you're already part of it that's yeah. the idea of social no, absolutely so w one of the issues now in the whole roe v wade debate I, I tweeted about this earlier we had tim ryan and we had obama I'm sorry, not Obama. We had uh, Jen Psaki talking about Biden. I don't know why I said Obama. We had Jen Psaki talking about Biden refusing to uh, uh, condemn late late term abortions. She was asked, I think it was by Ducey over at Fox News, whether Biden was in favor of restrictions on abortions. And she just, you know, he hawed around the answer and was like, it's between a woman, uh, woman and a doctor, woman and a doctor. Tim Ryan said the same thing. So for me, I've always been kind of in the center left position. It used to be the left liberal position in this country of like in the first trimester, maybe into the second, second and third trimester abortion are, are kind of just not OK. And it's it's supposed to be safe, legal and rare. But now you have one side saying unrestricted up to nine months. The woman is in, about to go into labor. The baby can be aborted. And then you have the right saying ban outright in every circumstance. So how do you find that middle? I mean, how do you, how do you, most people are now finding themselves, like there's no middle. There's, there's very few people left. I think, well, I think part of it, you know, depends upon the circumstances as to why uh, a particular woman wants an abortion. I'm not saying, I, I, I don't believe that all abortions should be uh, illegal. I don't believe that all abortions should be, should, should happen either. But um, I think it depends upon the circumstances. Uh, if a woman has been raped by a stranger, if a woman has been raped by her father, or, or it's a young girl, something like that, uh, you know, these are mitigating circumstances. It's, it's already bad enough, uh, a rape is bad enough, that that woman is going to remember that the rest of her life. Yeah. It's going to traumatize her. It's going to traumatize her even more if it's somebody within her own family, her father, okay? And if, uh, if that child is produced she's going to be confronted with that child every day as a reminder. Uh, is that something that we want? You know, that might be a decision for her to make and not I, for us to make. I suppose the issue is, you know, we, we've, 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 we've talked to a great, a great deal this past week about all the, the abortion, but I think one way to kind of elevate the conversation is what do you do when, when you have two competing political factions that, have just moved away from each other. Well, that's what Roe v. Wade is sort of bringing up in the cultural conversation is like, should local areas make that decision? I'm not, you know, it's I almost like that's the solution then to repeal Roe v. Wade. I'm or to, I'm overturn it. 
yeah it's just crazy how how controversial it is and how emotional it is but we have to have the conversation i i th here's what i think i think that we mentioned this briefly the other day if you look at the history of the united states and personhood that we have a tendency to move towards granting more personhood rights than rescinding them that in almost every circumstance we are continually expanding who gets access to what we deem to be civil rights it wasn't always the case in the United States with racism that uh, uh, people weren't granted full civil rights with women not being able to vote. I actually think that based on the trends of this country, we're going to move towards completely banning abortion outright. That will come to a point where people agree that they're going to say we deem a, an unborn baby to be a human life guaranteed constitutional protections. What was it like before Roe v. Wade? Daryl, do you m remember much about it? Yes, but vaguely. Was it like a big problem? Was abortion a hot topic? There wasn't social yeah, there was media. Yeah, it was always a hot topic, and and women were were you know giving abortions in secret, uh, doing it themselves with a coat hanger or having somebody else do it with a, with a coat hanger. I remember friends of mine uh, even did that, you know. Um, and then there were those who were who were very uh, vocal about it. You know, they would come out and and say, "Yeah, I had an abortion. What about it?" You know, things like that. But it was always very controversial. And you know they they uh, there were there were a, a ton of abortion clinics where you could go and get it done uh, legally, and there were always you know not almost say always but a number of times there would be protests out in front of the uh, clinics. It was particularly more violent back then, wasn't it? In some cases, yeah. I, I mentioned the guy I forgot now what his name was was Michael something who went up and down the East Coast uh, bombing the abortion clinics. Um, yeah, you know that that part was violent and killing doctors who uh, who performed abortions. As in, as in Dr. Gunn, but but not everything was uh, was violent. You know, there were there were a lot of loud vocal protests in front of some of these clinics. Let me let me ask you about your your view of how things have been going today. I mean, there's been a lot uh, in the past several years with the riots of the country uh, over George Floyd. I'm curious as to your perspective. You're older than us, and so you certainly have seen way more. Does it feel worse today in terms of the political divide than it has in the past? I wouldn't say that it really feels worse. You know, there's always been a divide, but people today are more outspoken and less uh, hidden about their views. There, there seems to be a more um, emboldening, if you will, today. Like, you know, you see people who used to wear um, hoods and masks uh, come out there with their uh, burning crosses, and now they come out in their regular clothes and express the same views. So they don't feel like, you know, they have to hide so much anymore uh, because their jobs are being threatened or whatever. When did you so let's like, we, we can just get started with your story for people who aren't familiar. Do you want to, you, So just in, in terms of the context, I'd love to, I want to talk about modern politics and all this stuff and where we are now. But I think your history might lend some uh, understanding to a lot of people. How did you you're, you're <laughs> famous for being the how did you describe it? The um, you inspired people to um, de-radicalize the Klan's members. Okay, so to, so to give you a little bit of background on myself, as I said, I was, I'm 64 years old, but I grew up as the child of parents in the U.S. Foreign Service, so I grew up as an American embassy brat. I, I was born in 58. I began traveling around the world at the age of, six, of, of, uh, of three in 1961. And uh, how it works is you, you get assigned to a country for two years, you come back here to the States, you're here for a few months, maybe a year, and then you're assigned to another country abroad. So my first exposure to school was overseas. I, I, I did kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade. And all the schools I went to overseas, this is back in the 1960s. My classmates were from Nigeria, Japan, Russia, Czechoslovakia, Germany, France, Italy, Sweden. Anybody who had an embassy in those particular countries, all of their kids went to the same school. So that became my baseline as to what school was supposed to be about. I had all these colors. You guys here are too young to remember black and white TV, but you know about it. I remember black and white TV, and I remember when color TV came in. It was like, wow, it's like a whole new dimension, right? You know, you never wanted to see black and white TV again. You saw something in living color. Okay, well, every time I would come back home from overseas back to my own country, the United States, it was like going from color TV to black and white, you know, because we did not have that amount of diversity in this country. 
in, in our schools. When I would come back, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated or the newly integrated. Just because uh, Brown versus the Board of Education desegregated schools in 1954, it didn't mean that integration took place overnight. It took years and years. But even in, in, in many cases still, it's not. Exactly. I'm, I'm... In fact, the uh, uh, Prince Edward County, Virginia, shut down. They refused to integrate schools, wow. the public schools. They shut down all public schools in Prince Edward County, Virginia, not for five days, not for five weeks, not for five months, for five years years, years, okay? Imagine how much education is lost in five years. When you go down there today, people my age, a lot of them are basically functional illiterates because they wow. missed five years of their education. If, you know, if they were in third grade, you know, they didn't go back to school until they were in eighth grade, you know, you know that kind of thing. Um, so you know, you're, you're dealing with that kind of thing. So look, look, look at kids today who have to go to school over Zoom over the last two years because of the pandemic. Some, some kids did better than others, but a lot, of, a lot of them did not do so well over Zoom because they weren't getting that personal one-on-one -on -one education. You know? Well, as, as, as an aside, too, I don't want derail, to derail too much. I, I think we're going to start seeing something similar because schools have started adopting ideological praxis in their teachings. Mm -hmm. So instead of telling a kid, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, they're saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, in what context are we talking so you actually had a viral trend where people, teachers, were saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. Because In what context? It was that 2.4 plus 2.4 equals 4.8, which is rounded up to 5. So if you round down 2.4, I don't know what kind of simplicity mess this they were intending. But it it's, was, it was, it's an issue of tribalism, and this is, this is, it's part of the polarization. The idea is that the people on the right started saying 2 plus 2 is 4, and sooner or later the woke people are going to say it's not. And then a point was being made by, you know, left tribal people where they're like two plus two could be five. Here's how. And then they say two point two point four rounds down to two. But two point four plus two point four is four point eight, which, which rounds to five. Therefore, two plus two is five. And then most people who are reasonable are just like two point four plus two point four is four point eight. End of story. If you want to make some weird equation that omits information for the sake of making your, your strange argument, I guess. But they're teaching kids this. You also have a lot of the critical race theory ideology stuff in schools where the kids are getting more of this kind of social, emotional learning as opposed to actually learning stuff. Okay, so let's, let, let's define two terms that you use just, just yeah. so that everybody's on the same page, not just us here, but, but everybody out here listening to us. So let's, let's, let's define the term woke, your, your definition of term woke and your definition of the term critical race theory. Woke is typically a reference to like a, a left tribal identifier. So it has a reference to critical race theory, critical theory, critical gender theory. It encompasses these different schools of thought. We got we to define all these things. Critical race theory is um, basically the, int the oh man, this getting, it gets tough to actually, is that a stink bug? Critical race theory is critical theory in a racial context. Critical theory is the, the political theory of the oppressed versus the oppressors. With Karl Marx back in the day, his critical theory was that the wealthy oppress the poor. The poor, the proletariat is oppressed, the bourgeoisie oppresses. Kimberly Crenshaw wrote a book called Critical Race Theory, which says this doesn't take into context the race, the racial component of the United States. Therefore, critical race theory is white people are dominant and they oppress all people of color. So critical race theory has several different subs subsequent schools of thought like intersectionality that a uh, black woman experiences different discrimination than a black man because there's also sexism plus racism. But the sexism plus racism is a different category than the sexism that a white woman would experience. So this is another school of thought within the realm of critical race theory. Critical race praxis is the implementation of these ideas into standardized learning. An example would be if I were to give you a math problem, I would say a train leaves Pittsburgh traveling at 100 miles an hour. A train leaves Cincinnati traveling at 75 miles an hour. They're 300 miles apart. How long? Blah, blah, blah. Critical race praxis gives math problems to kids, like in Florida. Jerome was stopped by the police 17 times in the past month. Harold was stopped three times. What percentage are black people stopped by police more than white people? So what they're doing is, it is a math question, but they're injecting an ideology, a praxis of critical race theory. Assuming that Jerome is black. Well, they, they, they do these things that are overtly racist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And but it'll show a little black character and it'll show a little white character and then they'll they'll do this problem. And so we've started seeing the emergence of a lot of that. What I see from this is uh, one viral video that went around is a kid who didn't understand pronouns because this is an, an wokeness includes what is crit, what is called critical gender theory, which is boys and girls don't exist. Doctors guess gender. And so there's a video of a little boy asking uh, he, he, he's, he's doing a pronoun worksheet and it says something like Juan gets on the swing. Which pronoun would you use? Janet uses jump ropes. Which pronouns would you use? And he put they for all of them. And his mom goes, why did you put they for all of them? And he says, how am I supposed to know if they're boys or girls? And she said, didn't you notice their names? And he was like, but you said there's no boys or girls in names. And so now the kids don't understand basic English grammar because of these of the praxis being injected in 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 our, you know, in the current generation, the current learning systems. So not to derail too much from what you were saying, because now we're getting particularly verbose. Uh, when you talk about these schools, the first thing I think of is at this point, schools have become so corrupt in many ways. I think regardless of whether we have them or not, people are going to become functionally illiterate. Basically, when you mentioned functional illiterates, I thought of the kid who didn't know how to use pronouns and everything that comprises that problem we're experiencing. Assuming that that uh, he doesn't uh, know that Janet is a female name or now it's uh, androgynous, right? Where it, Janet could be a male name or a female name. Like, for example, my name is Daryl. Uh, for the longest time, I thought Daryl was always a male name until an actress came along named Daryl Hannah. That's right. <laughs> well, so uh, so that defines wokeness. Was there another another term? No, that was a wokeness and a critical race theory. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. I think the impossible thing about it is that everything is blended together. And so every issue becomes inter with intersectionality. The like the reality is that if you're talking about race, you're talking race and gender are different conversations, but yet they're the same conversation. And so it makes it it makes it really hard to to talk about anything because so de woke blends all of that together. Yeah. And it, it's just it, that's it's hard to define because it me, it also means different things to different people. I think I could define wokeness as like it's like a faux awakening. People feel like they're having awakening right now, and but it's it's an awakening to like what they're being told is 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 real. So they just believe what they're told rather well, than a real like central awakening of like having like a reality shift or, so, or a you know what I mean. It's not like a like an internal struggling i mean maybe it is for them they're probably having a similar feeling to someone that's actually had a spiritual awakening on a hill meditating for 40 days but it's like a, fa a false awakening and people are making fun of it calling it oh they're woke they're so awake now have you ever heard the term red pilled red build red pilled no it's the inverse of woke but they basically mean the same thing okay if you are red pilled it's a reference to the matrix you get the blue pill the red pill the red pill wakes you up from the illusion of reality Woke means you've awoken to what's really going on. And so they mean effectively the same thing, a great realization of the lies you've been told. Based on my understanding and I think a fair research, red pilled is a bit trolly and more tongue in cheek. Woke is zealous and, and ideological. But I also think the woke stuff is manipulative and wrong for the most part. So, you know, we often have people on here and I talk. Well, about OK, so so, for example, uh, when I was in high school, uh, we were taught in, in the textbooks, I still got my textbooks, that, uh, that Robert uh, uh, Perry, uh, Admiral Perry, uh, discovered the, um, the North Pole. Not true. You know, uh, Matthew Henson discovered the North Pole. Admiral Perry was a white guy. Matthew Henson was a black guy. Matthew Henson was Admiral Perry's best friend. And they went on the exploration together. Okay, Perry got sick and told Henson to go on. Henson went on and discovered the North Pole. All right. Interesting. When uh, they got back, Perry told everybody it was Henson. They said, no, we can't give him the credit. And they gave the credit to Admiral Perry. All right. Admiral Perry was buried in Arlington Cemetery. Matthew Henson was buried in a pauper's grave. Uh, in the 1980s, when uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, was in office as president, uh, there was a, a, a bill put forth. Uh, Coretta Scott King and some other people came to him. And <clears throat> he uh, passed this bill. Now in the textbooks, it says Matthew Henson discovered the North Pole. Now, I knew that all along because my parents told me, even though it wasn't in the textbook. All right. Um, they exhumed 
Matthew Henson from the pauper's grave, grave, and now he's buried next to his best friend, uh, Admiral Perry, in Arlington Cemetery. When I was in school, uh, we did not learn that this country had internment camps for Japanese Americans. I didn't learn that until I was in college, and I was incredulous. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? No way. And I asked my parents, and they are like, yeah. You know, why wasn't, it in, why wasn't it in our textbooks? Because it was, a, it was a dark blemish on our history. It was a shameful thing that we did in this country. So did I become woke when I was in college? But that's not what wokeness. Is, all right, what, so what is woke, that? So uh, an example of wokeness is saying things like all white people are racist. All, all white people are not racist. But that's wokeness is not a reference to understanding how history works. So I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was a little kid, uh, I was told in school, Christopher Columbus discovered America, which is just not true. Right. There were already people here. But did you know that? Yes, because I had, uh, I had a mom who told me there were already people here. Right. And my, I, I tell the story all the time. She said, actually, Leif Erikson came to the, to the uh, North American continent a thousand before. years before Christopher Columbus. But honey, there were already people there, weren't there? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, did they teach you there were already people there? And I was like, yes. And she goes, didn't they discover this <laughs> continent? And I was like, yeah. I was like, then why did they tell me that? And she said, they think you're stupid, but they'll tell you the truth in college. And that was like a real anti-authoritarian moment for me as a kid. So, I so was that an awakening or, or a woke? So wokeness doesn't refer to learning the truth. Wokeness is typically, I mean, depending on who you're talking to. Right. If you're talking to people who are trying to avoid the overt ideologies of either, you know, extremists, any, any extremist faction. Wokeness is typically a pejorative term to reference someone who says, you're white, so you're racist. That's considered to be woke. Now, some people might use woke in a more lax manner, like perhaps towards the angle you're describing it. But uh, based on the, like this show and how we, we approach things, most people who watch would probably say they're anti-woke, but they completely agree with what you've said or would completely agree with the idea that Native Americans already were here. Right. The, the proper way to describe it is Christopher Columbus discovered... Uh, the Bahamas for Europeans as, as part of the European culture. He was the first to kind of bring that information to them. But again, Leif Erikson, also of European descent, dis discovered it. It didn't really make the rounds in the European continent. And other people were already here who had discovered the land. Typically, okay. typically people do not use woke as like a badge. You know, people who's even, even critical even woke people, people don't. No, say they don't. They yeah. don't. And so, so people who are like pro critical race theory wouldn't necessarily call themselves that. And I think, look, most people are pro uncensored history. I think that yeah. is a common thing that we need to get on the no, table. No, I, well, I, I would have to disagree with well, that. Well, maybe I don't. I'm. I'm. I don't have a statistic in front of me, but I think we all here want well, so un, uncensored history. The, the, and I. It, so it, hmm. it gets complicated because critical race theory. Some people are trying to say that critical race theory is the truth of history. That's some people's perspective. Other people would agree with teaching what you just said was omitted. Right. But that wouldn't, that, that's not the same as critical race theory. So take a look at this image. This is part of a book called Not My Idea, in which grade school children are shown the whiteness contract with a white hand reaching out and a devil tail and goat's feet. I think this is wrong to teach children that white people are inherently evil, inherently oppressors, or inherently racist that all white people are racist. And this is what woke typically means when we criticize it. I think uh, we should tell people that uh, some people are good, some people are bad, and race is not relevant to whether or not someone will be a good or bad person. You've got to find out who they are within. Would you agree? I would agree 100% with that. Well, the problem is, this is what they're teaching kids in school. Dude, we can see your pointy tail. Contract binding you to whiteness. You get stolen land, stolen riches, special favors. Whiteness gets to mess endlessly with the lives of your friends, neighbors, loved ones, and fellow humans of color. Sign below for the purpose of profit. Land, riches, and favors may be revoked at any time for any reason. Showing a white hand reaching out with a whiteness contract and devil's tail, I think is particularly dangerous to be teaching children. Okay, but now, so that's called critical race theory by your definition, correct? Yes. Okay, but there are also people who are calling critical race theory teaching the transparent history. Okay, people people banning books. Uh, no, no, not, these, not, not talking about these are the books being banned. Those, you, are, those are not the only books being banned, right? They're they're, so, they're, they're talk, talking about banning books on Rosa Parks biography out of schools. Not talking about slavery. Not talking about you know oppression and things like that. They're calling that critical race well, theory as well. But hold on. Uh huh. 
the, the challenge with this is I'm not familiar with a book on Rosa Parks being banned. And in the experience that we've all had here and probably most of our listeners, when uh, recently Florida banned math books, the left came out, woke people and said, see, now they're banning math. The issue was they were banning the math I explained to you, where the math problem isn't a math question. It says how many people are racist, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So Florida said, we don't want ideological praxis in our math books. We want math problems. Mm -hmm. So when we hear that they're banning books, it's a question of which books, why? Well, what we did was we had uh, several experts on who brought the books to us and showed us. This is this is the easiest and most notable example, saying whiteness is a, the devil. Do you remember about four years ago, the state of Texas changed all the the um, school public school books. They removed the word slave and slavery, and changed it to immigrant worker. That would be bad. At the same time, the New York Times removed the word slave from their game Wordle because it was offensive. So I would consider all of that to be in the same line of authoritarian censorship we don't want. Okay. So there was a big protest, and I think it was Macmillan and Press or whatever that did all the Texas uh, uh, school books, had to recall all those books and and re rewrite them, and now it's uh, enslaved people as opposed to slaves. So... They there is an, an effort. I think they did this. Didn't they remove master and slave from some coding language? Yeah, for on Git. Right. Yeah. Jeez. So I oppose exactly what you described. And what, 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 no matter where it's coming from, typically what we're seeing today, I don't think woke people. Well, actually, I take that back. Uh, they literally banned the word slave from Git. They GitHub. GitHub. And the New York Times, they have a, this game called Wordle where it's every day you try to guess a five-letter word, you literally can't guess the word slave because it's offensive. I think that's bad. I don't think books should be... I don't, I, don't think, I don't think this book should be banned from schools. I think this book should be banned from curriculum in which the teacher says, child, learn the truth. Whiteness is the devil. I think a teacher could say to a more age-appropriate group, take a look at this book and what these people believe about this idea mm. and approach it but the, But there are people who also consider critical race theory showing pictures of uh, of the four black people trying to integrate the uh, Woolworths food counter and having stuff poured on their heads. The girl walking, Ruby Bridges, walking into the school with the white people yelling behind her and all that yeah, kind but, of stuff. But all they, of they, that, they consider that critical race theory and they don't want their kids seeing that. But so, so the issue is these things can exist within the ideology of critical race theory in the context of critical race theory is rooted in Marxist uh, the Marxist uh, uh, philosophy of oppressed and oppressor. I do not agree with that. I think that's wrong. And I think when you put a racial tone on that, it's extremely dangerous because what they've started doing in, at Dearborn University in uh, Dearborn, uh, Michigan. I think it's in Michigan, they created a POC and non-POC digital cafe, meaning white people only, people of color only. In Seattle, they created diversity, equity, inclusion events for POC only, non-POC only. And that's under critical race theory. And they justified exactly how you explained it. They show racism from the past we all think is wrong and then say, see, shouldn't black people have their own private spaces separate from white people? And I say, if people in a private context, you know, within a certain reason, I'm ga I guess it's fine if you have a private club. In public accommodations like universities and, 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 and libraries, I don't think they should be allowed to force gender segregation. I'm, so, I'm sorry, racial segregation. They're the ones who actually want to get, a, get rid of gender segregation well. As just, well. just a few years ago, uh, what, maybe, maybe four years ago, five years ago, maybe even less, um, a high school in Mississippi, the principal had two separate proms, a black prom and a white prom. And you were not allowed to have any integrated couples at these. And problems. was this a was this a critical race theorist who had implemented it? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd be willing isn't to guess. it? They kind of overlap because it, it wouldn't be surprising if there are cases in the country where there's actual old school segregation, but you sort of have new school segregation and old school segregation coming together. So, Daryl, like, what is your response well, no, 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 to no, the no, kind hold, of the new? Take a look at this, right? Uh, I'm willing to bet the story you heard was actually about someone who was woke creating black only spaces like this story we have from Atlanta. No, it wasn't a well, black person creating the, the segregated problem. No, no, they're white liberals who do these things. There, 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 there are white progressive women who are overwhelmingly the woke who are creating racially segregated spaces. 
It's against the law. Atlanta parent filed complaint over alleged segregation of classrooms. This wasn't a white right wing racist who created this. It was a progressive white woman who created white only. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think this was actually a black principal. In the school, they segregated all the black students under the guise of critical race theory, saying that there, there's an idea that came from uh, Derek Bell. Are you familiar with Derek Bell? Mm-hmm. He believed that Plessy versus Ferguson was correct, that separate uh, but equal was the right way to approach racial issues. I believe it was Derek Bell. So uh, I don't have the book pulled up in front of me. One of the arguments that I've heard, um, at least him be attached to, and I heard fr- quite frequently with the Black Lives Matter protests, was that before desegregation, the black community had their own wealth, their own neighborhoods, and they had their own economy. Segregation took a weaker economy in the black community and forced it into the white economy, putting it underneath it, allowing white people to then oppress black industry and black business. That is the justification they use for bringing back segregation. The actual argument among the woke that Plessy v. Ferguson was right. And I, me, I come from a second generation mixed race family who told me the stories of life before Loving v. Virginia and the Civil Rights Act and the things they went through getting spit on. I'm sure you know better than than even I do because I just I grew up after the fact. And so when I started hearing the things that were were coming out of the modern iteration of the left and critical race theory, I said, those are bad racist things we should oppose. Okay, so now let's let's understand something. Okay, so when you say that uh, you know, they they say, okay, all white people are oppressors, all white people are racist, all black people are victims, and they'll always be victims. No, I, I don't agree with that. You know, th- that's not the way it is, okay? But that's How, the, the core definition of critical race theory. No, it's not the core definition it, of critical it, it, race it, theory. I gotta stop. Basically, it, critical it, theory. Cl- critical theory was Marx's approach to class-based oppression. And he said, the rich oppress the poor. Kimberly Crenshaw, in her opening chapter, literally says... White people oppress black people. It is critical race theory. No, I disagree with that. I, I'd have to see that because I've seen uh, Kimberly Crenshaw interviewed, okay? And, and she has been uh, challenged with that by the other guy. What's his name? Kendi or somebody. Ibram X. Kendi? Yes, okay. Well, they're Two both. different schools. They're two, both the same school. No, two different schools. No, 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 okay? What you're saying uh, leans more towards what uh, Kendi uh, has stated. Uh, for my for my uh, uh, watching uh, Crenshaw be interviewed, no, that is not the case. Okay, um, I don't have the computer here to bring it up, but uh, but I, w- I would say research that. Uh, that that is not you know there are several different definitions of critical race theory, and so you know there is no one universal definition of it. I think what happened is that the Romans uh, had a slaveocracy that spread into Europe and then into like feudalism. So they had still slaves as, as like their feudal people, the, the peasants. And then they, because their skin happened to be white or light, then they had enslaved people from around the North African coast and the East so that their slaves happened to have different color skins. And now because of that, it's created a system where the, the generations that follow those slaves had less education and less wealth and the slave owners. But it, it didn't it wasn't because the skin color. It just happened to be the Roman Empire happened to be the dominating empire. I don't think... It- well, you know, the Roman Empire evolved out of Africa. Okay, Italians come from Africa. The Moors. The Moors, exactly, precisely. Kimberly- and, and southern southern Italy, those Italians are dark. Yeah, the Sicilians particularly. Exactly, precisely. And I think that the, the, the racial component's been misappropriated to this class issue that we have of, like, the descendants of slaves, like, seven, fifth, sixth, seventh generation slave ch- children of, like, you know, the great, great, great grandfather was a slave, didn't have any education. So there's no familial wealth or there's less familial wealth. My great, great grandfather was a slave. OK, nice. I'm a descendant of slaves. Wow. OK, now we you know, we were promised um, at the end of slavery. What? 40 acres and a mule. Find me one person who got that. OK. Japanese Americans who were in internment camps or their descendants have received um, reparations. Native Americans, if you have one sixteenth Native American blood, you can get a government money. Okay, I got Cherokee in me, but I've never gone to get any money from it. Okay, so we we've made the apologies to Native Americans. We've made the apologies to uh, Japanese Americans. This country has never, never apologized for slavery. The person who came the closest to apologizing but never apologized was our uh, President Bill Clinton. What he said was, slavery was wrong. Those are his words. 
Now, saying something is wrong and saying we're sorry for doing it are two different things. How many people uh, died liberating the Japanese from the internment camps? I don't know the numbers. I think it's zero. They just opened the camps think, after the war, didn't they? I don't know. So the I think of this that, country overtly did wrong by putting people in these camps, yes. and then realized they did wrong. But I think they also they also did wrong by 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 putting people in shackles and selling them on the courthouse steps as absolutely. property. Absolutely. I suppose that the main difference, though, I actually agree with you. Um, I think I I actually think there should be some form of reparations. But I, I, I don't know if it's ever been uh, I don't know if the politicians will ever actually do anything meaningful in terms of this. And, and, I, and what's that called? Lying. No, it's called racism. That they won't do anything meaningful. Yeah. But I mean, you have black uh, political leaders who also won't do anything. You, meaningful. Got, you got black people who, who, who are worthless, just like you got white people who are worthless. Nobody has a, a monopoly on racism or, or being worthless. I don't think I don't think that it's a prejudice against race is the reason why they're not doing it. I think it's because they want to hold that over as an issue to gain power in politics. Have you listened to no. Coleman's Coleman's arguments on reparations? Coleman Hughes. Coleman yeah. Hughes, yeah. I mean, so it's a I don't think the fact that it hasn't happened yet necessarily means racism. It's it's more so extremely complicated because where do you draw the line? What percentage of black, do you I, have I, to be like? It's very I just, complicated. I just, I just have to uh, say, no, it's not complicated at all. Listen, what you know? D does racism exist? Absolutely. Yes or no? Yeah, I okay. think that people are afraid of what they're not familiar with sometimes. But but does racism exist? Well, there's no. Yes. We're we're the same race. We're the human species. Like, I, I understand. <laughs> there, 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 there's only one race, but you know Small what I'm asking? R, yeah, big do, R, do, R. Does racism exist in this country? Are there people uh, of different colors who are discriminated against? Okay. Uh, this country owned people as property, okay? We were considered, people like me, were, were, were considered three-fifths of a human being. We were bought and sold on the courthouse steps. Families ripped apart, just like when you got your first pet. You know, somebody's cat or dog had a litter, and your parents took you over and said, pick out one, and you took that kitten or that puppy from its mother. That's what happened to human beings in this country, okay? We were, we were taken from our our families. We were raped in front of our children, in front of, of, of mothers' husbands, and things like that. You know, about um, nine out of every ten black people in this country have some white blood in them. So, okay? um, be, you know, some of it, some of it consensual, some of it non-consensual. Let me tell you this: Thomas Jefferson. You all know he had a slave mistress, right? Yeah. Named Sally Hemings. But I bet you didn't know this. And if you doubt me, check it out. Uh, what what was uh, Thomas's uh, wife's name? Was it was it uh, Martha or Mary? I forgot now. I think it was Martha, wasn't it? Martha Jones. No, uh, Martha no, no, Jefferson. 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 I remember uh, Washington's wife. She's Martha for sure. Okay, so okay, that's Mary Jones. It was, Jones. Both. It was so Mary. They're both Martha. They're both Martha. Martha. Okay. both Martha. Okay. Like Bruce Wayne and Superman. <laughs> their moms. Bruce Wayne and Superman. They're both their moms are Martha. Martha okay. Kent and uh, Martha oh. Wayne. Okay, so um, Sally Hemings, who was Thomas President Thomas Jefferson's slave mistress. Did you know that she was a half sister to Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha Jefferson? Uh huh. You need to check that out. That's not in your history book, but you can find it because Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law, uh, Martha, Martha's uh, father. Okay, he had slaves too, right? And he had an affair with uh, Sally Hemings' mother, which produced Sally Hemings. If you look at a picture. Of, of Martha Jefferson and a picture of Sally Hemings, they look very similar, one darker, one lighter. How much is uh, one human life worth? Is worth a lot? You can't put a, you can't put a value on it. 828,000 casualties from the Union soldiers fighting to end slavery. 828,000 people died. Uh, endless amounts of wealth destroyed, homes ransacked, burned, completely destroyed. The country almost collapsed trying to end this. So while I still believe that there is an issue of reparations in terms of we cannot have, you know, people, people, you know, I've mentioned systemic racism on the show and people don't agree, but I think it's because people misunderstand what, what the idea actually is behind it. So uh, we'll get to that in a second. I, I think there needs to be, uh, you know, I, I lean liberal on all of these positions. There needs to be some way to strengthen the, uh, the weakest link in this country, those who are historically uh, impoverished or generationally impoverished. I think after we did away with a lot of the laws I, uh, that were bad, I think after we had constitutional amendments and then ultimately new laws that codified, you cannot do these things, we now need class-based solutions 
which should disproportionately help those who are disproportionately affected. Okay, so in the 1940s and 1950s, a lot of black people in this country moved to France. Now, people over in France are a lot whiter than white people in this country, all right? The French people treated these black people as equals. That's why we moved there. Eartha Kitt was one of them who played like uh, Catwoman on yep. Batman. She was the one who had the, the cat growl, right? Um, uh, James Earl, uh, not James Earl Jones, um, Paul Robeson, Memphis Slim, uh, Josephine Baker. A lot of these people moved to France because they were being treated as equals, all right? So, uh, you know, when people say all white people are, are oppressors, no, that's not true, okay? That, that, that's because people have been exposed to only a, a, a small group of white people, and those are the people here in this country. People in France did not oppress black people, all right? They didn't own slaves. This country owned slaves. Look, okay, look, think, <clears throat> you guys are too young to remember. Um, there, there is only one holiday in this country, one holiday in this country uh, that, um, that is named after a, uh, a, uh, an American man. One holiday in this country that's named after an American man. And guess what? That man is black. And people had a fit over that. It took decades to get Martin Luther King Day. People did not want to put it up there because he's a black man. There used to be two white guys who had a holiday each to himself. One, we used to have George Washington Day and we had Abraham Lincoln Day. And then it was decided that we had too many holidays. So they combined Washington Day and Lincoln Day into one day called President's Day. All right. But I remember when I went to school, we got off for Washington Day yeah, and too. we got off for Lincoln Day. All right. Now, but we had to fight, fight, fight to get Martin Luther King Day. Yet we celebrate. We celebrate. There is another guy who has a holiday all to himself. All right. He's not an American. He didn't discover a damn thing. He was a murderer, a pillager, and a rapist. And his name, Christopher Columbus. Okay, Martin Luther King never raped anybody, never pillaged any place, and never and and he 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 gave his life bringing people together. But yet we had no problem celebrating Christopher Columbus, who didn't discover America, as uh, Tim said. How do you discover something people are already here when you arrive? Yeah, his brothers were the real psychos, too. Uh, uh, Columbus let his brothers ransack. I think it was, were they in Haiti? Is that where they set up shop? It was in the Bahamas somewhere. And he just let his two brothers, like, drag women down the street by their hair as they would beat them and rape them and stuff. It was, hey, I wanted to confirm a couple things you mentioned earlier. From Newsweek, uh, there's an article from, this is like uh, September 21, Martin Luther King Junior and Rosa Parks books among those banned in Pennsylvania school district. I didn't read into this article, and I don't know why they were banned, but that's an article from Newsweek. I'll, I'll tell you, here, here's the, here's the very, challenge. Very quick, the other thing is Sally Hemings is apparently the uh, half-sister of Jefferson's wife, Martha yes. Wales Jefferson. That's from Monticello.org. One of the challenges with uh, any, any cursory story about banning books is that we recently had a book banned in a bunch of schools called Gender Queer. The Washington Post and the New York Times wrote that it's just a story about growing up queer and a story that kids need. But the book actually also displays graphic images of sex between what is probably minors, and Amazon rates it as being 18 up. When you hear the story just in passing or on the surface, if you actually read the New York Times and the Washington Post, they won't tell you why the book was actually banned. They'll simply say anti-trans or anti-queer bigots banned the book because they're banning books. You then actually open the book and say, whoa, they wanted middle schoolers to see blowjobs? Yeah, I don't know about that, but that's actually in the book. Mm. I can't show you the book on right. YouTube because we'd get banned if we showed it. So, right. Tim, can you confirm that there's kind of a split within critical race theory between these two different camps that Daryl's talking about? Well, I think I'd that call it a Mott and Bailey, right? So when you actually, uh, uh, in that, what, what is it, the... I always confuse the two. One of them, uh, are you familiar with the Mont Bailey argument? No. They'll say something like, we are just trying to teach the true history of racism in America. And then you go, oh, okay, well then what is this? Or I'm sorry, the, uh, the way it works is, they'll say something like, all white people are racist. 
all white people are oppressors because whiteness is property. Kimberly Crenshaw actually said that. It's in her original book. Whiteness as property grants people specific access to things other people can't. Therefore, white people oppress all other people of color. You then say, hey, whoa, wait a minute. You, you can't call all people racist. You can't show a picture of a devil who's white with a whiteness contract. And then they go, we're just trying to explain the true history of this country. Uh, it's a Martin Bailey argument. You start with this very aggressive approach. And then when someone actually investigates and call you out, you retreat saying, no, 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 no. It's just about the true history of this country. So for someone like me, the true history of this country is this country was built on racism. Okay. Well, it was, it was, be, I mean, the world itself is still just racist, but the United States. No, 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 let, let's, let's, uh, uh, no, no. The world itself is not racist. This country is racist. There is discrimination in the world. For example, in Northern Ireland, okay, like here in our country, if you're a Catholic and I'm Protestant, there's no big deal. No, who cares? In Northern Ireland, it's conflict. Oh yeah, that's not racism, okay? That's in, tribalism. Okay, in no, it's religion. Okay, but in, no, um, it's, it's tribalism. So uh, if you, so having, ha I'm not going to try to be an expert on the Irish Republicans and the Protestants, the Catholics, and the Orange Order or anything, but at least having been there and 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 covered this both sides of this. It's not about Protestant or Catholic. That may, be, that, that may be what it's described as, but you notice really weird things. One side's pro-Palestine, one side's pro-Israel. One side believes in socialism, one side believes in capitalism. One side is pro-militaristic imperialism, one side is anti-intervention. What happens is two different factions hate each other and they adopt whatever the other side opposes. And so tribalism emerges where I asked uh, on the piece. Isn't, isn't that what, what, what we're experiencing right here, right now with, with uh, Republicans and Democrats? Right. That's, that's why it's. Is that uh, tribalism? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's why. By your definition. Okay. So when they say Candace Owens is a white supremacist, something is wrong, right? They said I was a white supremacist. Something's wrong. I don't always right. agree with Candace Owens, though. Right. So the issue is, for me, I don't think race uh, uh, is the principal component of the divide right now. I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. I'm saying in a separate issue, we have a problem of tribalism in this country. And I think just not to derail you, because I was mentioning right. when, I, when you mentioned Northern Ireland as, as being religious, it's tr it's tribal. It's it and, started as a religious conflict that became more tribalized over time. That's okay, same with so, politics. All right, in so the let's United go. States. Let's go from from Northern Ireland to Lebanon. Okay, there is Christians and Muslims. In Israel, it's Jews and Palestinians, okay? So these, these are, are, are religious discriminations. You wouldn't call it racism. In this country, it's racism, okay? You know, people were bought and sold. People were owned. This country was built on a two-tier society, white supremacy at the top and slavery at the bottom. That's what built this country. And as we progressed over the decades, we progressed like this, well, may, 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 maybe like this, is it, is it but fair never to, like this. Is it fair to say the Native Americans were on the bottom? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were. They were yeah, absolutely, they were exter on the bottom. Absolutely. You know, not. Not. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. If From we should trailer make it tears a, and etc. Yeah. I don't so, know if we should make it a hierarchy. You know. Of, I, I, you know. You know I, I, and, and, and to this day, we still discriminate against Native Americans. You know, there, there are a lot of phrases. You know, that you don't even realize that are that are uh, uh, pejorative or derogatory. Like you know, you say you know, man, that guy went off the reservation. Yeah. Where do you think that comes from? Right. Or it's none of your cotton picking business. Where do you think that comes well, from? Well, that one we all know. Okay. That was or, like Foghorn or, or, Leghorn, man. Or, or, or he comes from yeah. the uh, or he comes from the wrong side of the tracks. So, right. Daryl, you're president. How, do, president. how who, do you deal who, with this? Who, who's my president? No, I'm saying theoretically, if you were president. Oh, oh if I was president. If you okay. were president, how are you handling this? I'm having more talk, more discussion. I'm the same way I'm handling it right now. I bring opposing forces together. What about to specifically table. in terms of reparations? What would you like to see? What I would like to see, A, is an apology, okay? And B, uh, reparations in terms perhaps of, of education, tuitions. Not necessarily be handing out people money necessarily, but provide people the means to get a great education, all right? Because that way you can you can uplift you can help uplift yourself. What you know, do you what do you what do you think? Let's let's go back to the abortion thing. Uh, what do you think about the history of Planned Parenthood? Are you familiar with it? The history of it? No, yeah. I'm not familiar Mar with the Margaret history Sanger of it. was. Uh, I know the name, but I, I'm not familiar she with was all a, the. A eugenicist, mm -hmm. and one of her. Uh, we can't say the name of the project she created because it uses a, a, an iteration of the N word, which would get us in trouble on YouTube. But her idea was to go around to the black community 
and start uh, um, propagating birth control practices to stop black people from having kids. Let me tell you something. My mother was a victim of that, okay? There was a big scandal back in the 50s where doctors were systematically giving women hysterectomies all and, right? and in order to, to, to cut down the black population. That's right. And my and mother was a, was a victim of that. And you don't find that out until, you know, 20, 40 years later, just like the uh, Tuskegee experiment, just like Agent Orange, you know, the government doing all these kinds of things, and you don't find out about it until much later. Yeah, or like uh, Pfizer data dumps and stuff like that. Mm. They wanted to wait 75 years to give that information out. But I, I digress. Uh, I'm into repairing the system too, reparation, whatever you want to call it, repairing it. And I agree. I don't think throwing money at people is the way to repair right. the communication. I mean, obviously, communication is real. Do you think school choice is legit or you follow that at all? School choice? Yeah, it's instead of like people sending their kids to a pu public school every year that costs a certain amount of money. Instead, you get a voucher for that amount of money that you can spend at any school of your choice or homeschooling if you set up a homeschooling curriculum. Uh, does that appeal to you at all? Uh, I'd have to I'd have to look at that some also, more. Also, it was very vague, and I don't know if I described it exactly right, but it's the idea that instead of being um, having to adhere to a public school system or private, mm -hmm. that you would get to choose what you where you send your kid, and you'll you'll have credits along with that. Because I think education and communication is the key to moving forward. Absolutely, I agree one hundred percent. I'm I'm one hundred percent pro education, and you know uh, it would have to be schools that uh, you know that are top notch. You know, you would have the right to go to those schools. I mean, there was a time where I couldn't go to Harvard, where I couldn't go to Princeton because of, because of the color of my skin. Yeah. That's why we have what we call HBCUs, right? Historically black colleges and universities. That's why the United Negro College Fund was founded and things like that. Um, so, and, and by the way, I went to an HBCU. I went to Howard University, uh, which was founded by General George Howard, who was a white guy. Is that gonna do it? So uh, I'm trying to pull up the specific story. Google's not to uh, let me let me see if I can do this. I, I, I did have another thing pulled up. I want to ask you about. Sure. I, I hope that YouTube can start to understand context of, oh, of language. Well, I mean, we'll see if well, they can, if, if the algorithm detects the word that Daryl just said and demonetizes the video. That is what, just what, what, so what, unacceptable. Uh -oh, what did I no, do? it's OK. It's OK. Use uh, use the N word, which so no, let, you. Let, 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 and N word. Oh, uh, let me let me let me ask you. Uh, we have a story from Independent. Harvard University will hold first ever black only graduation ceremony on. Uh, this is from May 2017. Do you agree with institutions creating racially segregated? No. So I, I I agree with that. And this is this is not coming from the right. This is coming from. Like I said, it. nobody has a monopoly on stupidity. Huh. Let me. I want. I wanted to ask you about the abortion thing because it's big in the news, and this is a really fascinating one because. One of the things we hear from a lot of people on the pro-life side is that the foundation of Planned Parenthood was eugenic eugenicists who wanted to depopulate the black you know, population community in this country. I just pulled up the uh, 1990 to 2006. It's a census, census government uh, um, abortion demographic. And the interesting thing is that in 2006, for every 1,000 women, there were 14 abortions. But for every 1,000 black women, there were 50 abortions. So... I look at this, and I think so there's is an, that tribalism or is that racism? I think it's racism. Thank Both, you. probably. Absolutely. I think racist tribals. I, I think when you look at the locations of Planned Parenthood facilities, they tend to be in black and Latino areas, not lower income areas. Just like um, when you look at all the advertisements and billboards um, for cigarette smoking and, and and alcohol, usually in uh, impoverished black areas. Yep. So I, I, I'm curious as to what your what, you know what your thoughts on this would be. You know. Why is it that in 2006, for, for every 1,000 uh, black women, there's 50 abortions, but every one, for, for every 1,000 white women, there's 14 abortions? How do you think something like that happens? Racism. But, Racism. Sure. But like, mm -hmm. it, is it, are, are there racists who are advocating for, you know, are these pro-choice racists who are trying to trick black people or how is it racist? They're trying to, cut. okay, let me tell you what's happening here. When, when you were a kid, even though you're a lot younger than I am, and when I was a kid, when you, even when your parents were kids and your grandparents were kids, the black population in this country was 12%. Native Americans, 1%. Hispanic people, around 2%. Uh, Asian people, around 3%. Whites, 86 87%. 
all right? The U.S. Census is taken every decade, every 10 years. You can Google uscensus.gov and see the trends, all right? Today, black people remain just over 12%, like 12.9, 13%, all right? Native Americans remain at 1%. Um, Asians have pretty much doubled. They're like at 5.9, almost 6%. Latino, Hispanic people have more than quadrupled, 17-something percent. If you, t if you take just black people, 12%, Hispanic people, 17%, that right there is 29% non-white. That's almost a third, all right? This is happening, all right? Uh, today, the, the last census was, was last year. I'm sorry, two years ago, 2020, all right? White people in this country right now are 59%. All right. In the year 2042, which is two uh, decades from now, this will happen for the first time in our country. This country will be 50 percent white, 50 percent non-white. All right. For the first time between 2045 and 2050, it's going to flip and whites will become the minority in this country. Whites are already the minority globally, but in this country, they are the majority. Uh, you guys may may know the term white flight. Yep. Okay. White flight barely exists in our country anymore because Ameri the, the, the color of America's landscape has changed so much that anywhere you go, there's already somebody there who doesn't look like you. And so people are, people, there's a large swath of the American, of the white American population that doesn't care about this happening. Hey, it's evolution. I don't care. No big deal. I don't have a problem with that. But there's also a large swath that does care about that. They feel they're getting squished out. You know, you know, we built this country, we wrote, wrote the Constitution, you know, and now, you know, our, our identity is being, you know, squashed out with race mixing and people moving us out and so forth and so on. So they, they are fearing this happening. And this is a problem for them. And this is why, you know, we're seeing a lot of these things, you know, that you're talking about, voting rights changing. Um, and people, you know, uh, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just what voting rights in particular? Where they're trying to rewrite the voting rights bill. And, and what's going to be next? The civil rights bill, right? Well, I just ask because they're doing it everywhere. And it's the left and the right. So I'm not sure the context, right? So in, in a bunch of the blue areas, they've, they've changed the voting laws dramatically. Pennsylvania, there was a lawsuit where they ruled the Republicans and Democrats made an agreement on voting changes that was ruled unconstitutional recently. So you, 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 you we're saying when you when you have sat on the throne of power for 400 years as white supremacy has sat there, it's hard to get off that throne. OK, say as, as you know, some of us are musicians here. Right. So if you have a number one hit, number one on the charts, you don't want to see yourself fall down to number two and number three and number four and then fall off the top 100. You want to stay at the top. So when you, when you sat on the throne of power for 400 years, and I came here 400 years ago in 1619, all right? And, you know, you, you got, you got a, our, our last president sat on the throne of power for only four years, and he thinks he's still there. It's hard to give up power. But I, I, you're operating under the pretext that like what, what a lot of what we're seeing in modern politics from Republicans is due to them not wanting to lose white power. Yes, but but where where does that idea? Now, come now from? I'm not saying just Republicans because you know you know there are racist Republicans and there are plenty of racist Democrats. Okay. Do you do you do you agree with um, Harvard's affirmative action plans? What are they? So if I, I believe in affirmative education, I believe everybody. I don't I don't believe in lowering standards. So, in order to, in order to, you know, and having quotas to get people, you know, up there and lower the standard. No, I don't believe in that at all. That, that, but that, I do believe in affirmative ed education, giving everybody an equal opportunity to get educated. So Harvard, it's uh, if you're Asian, you have to score, I think, thirteen hundred, and if you're black or Hispanic, you have to score lower, like eight or nine hundred on your SATs or something like that. So they make it more difficult for Asians, and they make it easier for black and Latinos. I think that's wrong. I, I think they should. I just that. said that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, don't lower, don't lower the bar. So Always this is keep the bar up. This is the, this is the issue I'm fighting when I say things like critical race theory should not be allowed in curriculum. Critical but now, race praxis. but now let, let's talk about what you just said. OK, so I, 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 I I've sat there with neo-Nazis and KKK people, et cetera. And I said, how can you hate me? You don't even know me. 
and sitting two feet in front of me. Well, Mr. Davis, you have to understand one thing. You know, you know, black, you know, black people are prone to crime. And, and this is evidenced by the fact that there are more black people in prison than white people. What he's saying is 100% true. The data shows that. The, stat, the statistics show there are more black people in prison than white people. So what he is saying is 100% right. But so that justifies his thinking, you know, we need to keep black people down because they will, the crime will grow. But because it enforces what he already believes as a KKK person or a neo-Nazi or whatever, uh, or a white supremacist, if you just want to use a general umbrella, um, he is satisfied with that, with that statistic or that data. He doesn't bother to look behind the data and find out why. And why is it? Uh, why is it? Because uh, black people tend to get imprisoned for longer sentences than white people committing the same crime. When you find a state, like let's just say the state of Maryland, a few years ago, well, more than 10 years ago, Governor Paris Glenn Denning of the state of Maryland put a moratorium on the death penalty, as, as have a lot of states. Why? Because black people were being legally executed for their crimes where white people went to prison for life or life with parole. That, okay, so 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 he, what he wanted to do was, you know, we want to put a ten-year moratorium on the death penalty to study why this is happening. What the hell do you need to study? You know why it's happening. It's called racism. White people have been studying black people for four hundred years. If you haven't learned anything in four hundred years, you're not going to learn anything in ten years. I, I think I think class plays a a, a big role in why we see the crime rates the way they are. I think people who are in poverty. Uh, you tend to see higher crime in lower income areas. It's not absolute. It's not the only reason. Right. But the the issue with um, uh, black people in prison, typically what you'll hear from the right is, I shouldn't say the right. Typically you'll hear from white identitarians is that they commit a disproportionate amount of crimes relative to other races. We hear that all the time. But why? They don't have the opportunities. They're not being given the opportunities. Why? Because of racism. Now, but that would be a, uh, that, uh, that would be by class. No, so no, we're no, 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 no. You know, it's it's, it's by the fact. That it's it's by color. Okay, it's by color. I know it's both. Well, it, it may be class, but you know, a, a, as a black man, I, I I have experienced things that you guys will never experience. Okay, you know, I get pulled over ten times more than you do. All do right, you though? huh? Do you? I do. Yes, how, how I do. do. Know, how do you know how many times I've been pulled over? I don't know, but but, 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 by, but by looking at you, I can tell you I have, I have. Okay, I, I reject that on, this, on uh, outright. Well, then, you, you well, then, well then, let, let, let's let's go let, let's go and, and, and compare those times. Okay, and plus I've lived longer than you have. You have, and, yeah. and you were around. Uh, to, to, okay. to be fair, considering you were around in in pre civil rights era, I, I, I I've absolutely been, I've been pulled one. over just for having a white woman in my car for I no was, other reason. I, I've I've been uh, I've been pulled over and had cops plant drugs in my car. I've I've been pulled over completely illegally, like for no reason at all, and then had my license suspended. How many times? So my, I've been pulled over uh, illegally in my life probably four or five times. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's a drop of pepper and a salt shaker. How many yeah. times have you been pulled over? You can't even count the number. Like more well, than 50? I, I was saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and so still today. You are you you are almost twice as old as I am. Mm -hmm. You were uh, uh, you've you've lived through eras of you know pre civil rights and all that stuff. So I I can't speak to that. But uh, I, I, I've, I've been pulled over, and, and, and I'm not trying to say that uh, I do. But what I'm trying to say is I don't, I don't respect you telling me you know outright without actually listening to me or knowing anything about my family or my life or what we went through, that you know outright I didn't experience these things. No, no, I didn't say you didn't experience these things. Or that— No, I said I've been pulled over more times than you have, is what I said. And, and, and I stand You are older that. than me, though. Doesn't matter. I mean, doesn't it does. matter. I'm, I'm also a lot darker than you are. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. If, okay. If, if, and I and I had okay, listen. <clears throat> I I uh, I I lived in, in a place called Potomac, Maryland. Okay, which tradition is a, is, a, is an all white or predominantly white uh, area. It's it's mixed now. All right. My family was the second black family to move into our neighborhood. My father was a senior foreign service officer. My father was Richard Nixon's interpreter when he was vice president of the United States, when he went to Russia, uh, he was vice president to Dwight Eisenhower. He went to Russia to have what was called the kitchen debate with uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the famous kitchen debate. My father was Nixon's interpreter. 
My father was one of the first black Americans to speak Russian, all right, fluently. My father spoke nine languages fluently, all right? My father was one of the first black Secret Service agents in this country, all right? And, then he, and, and the Secret Service would only let him go but so high. He did such a good job uh, interpreting Russian for Nixon. Nixon came back and told Eisenhower about him, and Nixon and Eisenhower called my dad into the White House, and Eisenhower told my dad, you have gone as far as you can go in the Secret Service. You should, you, you should, you should take the Foreign Service exam. You can go higher there. So my dad took the Foreign Service exam and became a Foreign Service officer, but there was still a ceiling for black people in the Foreign Service. But, but let, me, let me just finish, okay? So in Potomac, Maryland, my dad had a Mercedes, second black family in the area. My dad was getting pulled over in our own neighborhood. I was a teenager. What, okay? When was it? Like what uh, year was it? it uh, we were there uh, in 1971 through, um, let's see, I still own the house there. But um, I, uh, I have another house where I live. Um, 1971, he died in 2018. So between the, uh, more black people started moving in probably in the mid to late 80s, all right? Uh, they, the cops thought my father walked into the neighborhood and drove out. So when I turned 16, I got what all black parents give their young boys. It's called the talk. You, you, have you heard of the talk? I had the talk too. Okay, you yeah, had the talk. Tell too. me about it. Okay, the talk. The talk is what black parents give uh, six, uh, their their young boys, especially uh, when they start driving. You know, when you get pulled over by the police, even if if the cop is wrong, do not argue with them. Just take the ticket, sign it. We'll go to court. We'll, we'll settle it in court because you can get shot. But but see, this killed. this is the issue I have with. I, I think what you're saying is racist. The, right. I, the idea that black people exclusively do that or it's predominant among black people when that's actually a normal thing most people do. No. So no. Per perhaps it's a class issue because <laughs> my, all of my friends and myself had the exact same talk in the exact same way. I was told no matter what happens, when you're pulled over, you turn the light on, you turn the car off, keys and wallet on the dashboard, hands on the steering wheel, you roll down the window and you don't move. You answer the officer's questions. You do not argue with him. Do you understand? Yes. T say it back to me. I'm sorry, Tim, but you are 100 percent wrong. So, okay? I, but so when it's it's just no. I, I think it's something. fair to say that you're older than I am. You've we, we agree on the racism of the past, and I absolutely we agree. agree. We, well, I completely we, we agree. can agree on the racism of the past, but we can also talk about the racism of today. And I agree a, a, a lot on it. What I don't agree with is that this, you know, uh, this, it's it's strange to me to hear. The idea of the talk. Perhaps white suburban upper class wasps don't do that. But growing up no, no, no. In, See, in, in the south side of Chicago, in mixed race areas, in gang territory. We I'm from Chicago. We, anyway. and you're from Midway? I'm from Chicago. 500 East 33rd. Oh. Right on the south side. Right. Yeah. Midway. So I'm on uh, uh, 47th, 49th in Laramie. So I'm okay. two blocks away from the LeClaire courts. I had the talk too. Mm -hmm. My friends all had the talk. Everyone had the talk. The talk existed among white kids, Polish kids, Mexican kids, Asian kids, and black kids. I think the nuance is you have the talk for the inner city kid. Would every inner city kid's going to get that talk? But you're saying in the suburbs, black kids get. Oh, the he's talk. from the south side of Chicago, same as me. But yeah, yeah, but I, but uh, I, different I'm, part I'm of here, south side. Yeah, but also um, here in, Pot in well in Potomac, Maryland, Lily White, Potomac, Maryland. Okay, now, um, sure enough, when I started driving, when I turned 16, I was getting pulled over in my own neighborhood. All right. Um, I dated a woman in Luray, Virginia. Luray, Virginia is like, are you all familiar with, with Mayberry? Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> okay. You, uh, th there was a TV show called, oh, the, yeah. called the Andy Griffin Andy show. Griffin, yeah. Okay. And Mayberry was just, you know, little lily white town. Everybody knew everybody, real small town. You know, no black people on the show. And, um, you know, just super nice town. That is Luray, Virginia. You know, you hear the Luray Caverns, et cetera. So I began dating a white woman down there. And um, within two weeks, the Lou Ray City Police, who did not know me from Adam, everybody, can say, everybody knows everybody down there, went to her house and told her that I was a drug dealer. And she said, why? Why, why would you say that? He, no, he's not. Because he drives a black Lincoln Town car with dark windows. That was their excuse. Okay. Now, the, but but let, 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 let me get back to my conversation with with the uh, clan leader. All right, so he told me I'm a, I'm a criminal. He didn't bother to look in, into the background as to why these black people are in prison more so than white people. Then he goes on to tell me 
that, um, that, that black people are inherently lazy. We don't want to work. We want to scam the government welfare system. We always have our hands out for a freebie. All right, so now <clears throat> I'm sitting here. I've been called a criminal. I've been, I'm, now I'm being told that I'm lazy. And then he tells me, and then I've heard this many times thereafter from other Klan people, that black people are born with a smaller brain than white people. And the larger the brain, the more capacity for intelligence. The smaller the brain, the lower the IQ. And he says that this is evidenced by the fact that year after year after year, black high school students score lower than white high school students on the SATs. Again, he is 100% correct. Black kids do score a lot lower than white kids on the SATs. All right. Now, the data shows that. So it, it, uh, it enforces what he already believes about black inferiority. So he doesn't bother to look any further. But why is that? Well, where do most black kids go to school in this country? In the inner city. Where do most white kids go to school in this country? In the suburbs. It is a fact. Inner city schools are not as good as suburban schools. All right? There's not the opportunities. There's not the, te the, the textbooks, the, the quality of teachers, etc. I can guarantee you black kids who go to school in the suburbs can score just as high, if not higher, than some white kids. And white kids who go to school in the inner city can score just as low as some black kids, if not lower than others. It has and nothing to do with the color of the student's skin I, or the size of his brain, but has everything to do with the educational system in which that child is enrolled. I would also say I'm pretty sure the brain thing is just not true. Of course it's not ridiculous. true. But um, I, I, I find, one of the things I find interesting is that the inner cities are all Democrat run and typically have been for generations. Chicago, for instance, I think for 80 years now or 100 years has been run strictly by Democrats who keep promising to solve these problems and never do. So for me, I was just like, these people are just lying about everything. And typically what they do just makes things worse. And then you look at the suburbs and they have a tendency to lean Republican, or at least they were for a while till Trump came along, to be honest. And so I wonder why it is that the political party that keeps claiming, well, to be honest, not 100 years ago, but in the, in the past 50 years, these are the this is 60 years. This is the parties claiming to fight for the, you know the black community, but continually just th just things can just get worse. Okay. I mean, New right. York's New York's a great example. Yeah. New York is Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. Sometimes there's a mayor who's Republican or independent, but it is overwhelmingly the biggest Democrat stronghold in the country, and it's where it's you also see the bigger city, the biggest city, in big the city for sure. But it's where you get stop and frisk. It's where you get the, the, the complete disproportionate cops will give a ticket to a black guy drinking a 40, but they'll not to a white person drinking wine. I mean, these are these are liberal areas. Not well, you, well, you know why why uh, why there's a higher penalty for crack cocaine than regular cocaine, right? Was it more, more addictive? No. Because more black people use crack cocaine because it's cheaper. I want I wanted to ask you more poor people use crack cocaine in the past uh, in the past 18 years. Have you ever been uh, illegally pulled over with drugs planted in your car by the police? No. Not, uh, illegally pulled over, yes. Drugs planted, no. So why is it that I've had that happen to me and, and you didn't? Luck. Just, just, it was, I mean, Luck. in the Luck past the 18 draw. years, so. Um, I, I thought I was going to have some plan at one time. Uh, my band and I were coming home from a gig and we got pulled over and the cops uh, figured, you know, there had to be drugs in the, drugs in the van because I have dark windows you know, so people can't see in and see the drum sets and the amplifiers and whatever else is in there, right? Um, so uh, he starts making us pull out all the amplifiers. And he's like looking in the back of the amps, looking in, in the drum kits, in the drum cases. He was, he was not satisfied that there were no drugs there. He made us wait 30 minutes while he called the canine a patrol. Canine had to come. And we all had to get out of the van, sit on the damn side of the road, that had, while the dog runs through the van sniffing for drugs. So, so, and he still didn't find any. All right, the dog didn't find any, and so I, so I figured, okay, this guy's not going to give up. He he's probably going to plant something in there. Uh, he didn't, fortunately. And then he, and then he says, okay, uh, uh, you're free to go. And I say, well, why did you know why did you go through all this? And he says, oh, we're training the dog. That's bullshit. When I was in, in 2012, I was in Chicago with a group of friends, and uh, we had been uh, covering one of the protests there. At the end of the night, I think we had gotten some, like, Maxwell Street, because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're from Chicago— it's gone you know, now. It's gone? Maxwell Street is gone, yes. Oh, wow. Well, anyway, we, uh, we got surrounded by about 12 vehicles, some unmarked. 
they uh, pulled us out of the car at gunpoint and did basically what you, you described. They, they pulled us all out. They wrote down our credit card numbers, our IDs, our passports. They started banging on everything, trying to pop things in the car open. And then after about 10 minutes, another cop shows up and he points to me I'm, and we're all in cuffs mm -hmm. and he makes a motion. The guy uncuffs me and he says, oh, you, uh, sorry, you matched the description. You're no problem. I got that all the time. So they also had raided the apartment we were staying at. And then they also uh, tried to get someone through what we believe was a, a criminal informant to plant drugs in our car, but I wouldn't let them. They kept trying to get Adderall from the basement and bring it in the car. And I told them, if you go anywhere near that apartment, the cops went in the apartment. This guy was like, I'm going to go inside real quick. I said, if you go in there, we're leaving. You're not coming with us. And he's like, but I need a ride. I'm like, if you go in there and you bring anything, you are not coming with us. We found out later through a series of text messages, a person that was dating one of the cops after getting criminally charged with something, surprise, surprise, was telling him to put Adderall in our car. We were then told that on the scanner, they were describing our vehicle and looking for us. Uh, in, the, in the past 18 years, uh, I, you know, I, don't, I don't really drive all, all that much anymore. Usually other people are driving. I, don't, I tend, to, tend not to drive. Other people drive. Uh, so I would say from like 18 to 25, when I was mostly driving, I had been pulled over illegally maybe five times. What I mean by illegally is I've been pulled over way more than that. But pulled over illegally is when there's no justification for it. Mm -hmm. And the cops would make something up. Uh, that was, uh, you were swerving. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was when they planted drugs on me. So I, I, the only reason I didn't go to jail when they planted drugs in my car was because first what they did was they, they pulled me over illegally and said, uh, the guy says I was swerving, but then goes, oh, whoa, oh, you're smoking pot which I wasn't because I don't smoke. I don't have tattoos and I barely drink. Uh, I mostly don't drink. And so they out of the car. I say, okay, because, you know, I had the talk, hands on the steering wheel. I get out of the car. I have, keep my hands up. He immediately cuffs me, calls his partner. His partner shows up. First thing he does is go to my car and plants a nug of weed, takes it out within a, a few seconds and walks up to me holding it in his hand and says, what is that? And I said, I don't know. And he says, it's marijuana. And I said, is it yours? And he says, it was in your car. I said, no, it wasn't. And he said, confess that this was yours and this will all go easier on you. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's not mine. And he said, confess that it was yours or it's going to be worse. And I said, that's not mine. And then he makes a look. He walks back to my car. The other cops are asking me a bunch of questions. I very much am just not saying anything. I was about 19 at the time. The cop walks back out. Surprise, surprise. He popped up in the glove box. What did he find? A firefighter emblem. My dad was a firefighter. He said, who's a firefighter, kid? I said, my dad. The other cop takes the cuffs off, go home, and they get in their car and they left. Mm -hmm. The only reason they didn't decide to charge me with possession illegally by planting drugs in my car was because they found out that my dad was a firefighter and there's like, oh, can't do that. I wonder why it is I experienced that. I wonder why it is they experienced the cops pulling me over at gunpoint. I wonder why it is that I was driving 10 miles under the limit on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago when I was exiting at Belmont Avenue, which is a 45 mile an hour speed limit, and I get pulled over abruptly as I'm exiting. And the cop says, you were going 20 over. And I said, officer, I'm, I'm exiting. And he goes, tell it to a judge. And they suspended my license for that. I wonder why it is that I was driving to O'Hare Airport and I had a cop nearly rear end me. And so when I turned, when I put on my signal to move over the right lane, he immediately flips the lights on and said, you started speeding the moment I came up on you. And I said, you, you, you I nearly you rear ended me. me. And he says, tell it to a judge. Mm -hmm. And so I end up losing my license for years. Why did that happen to me? Was it because my family was poor and we couldn't afford lawyers? Was it because my car was a piece of crap, 1989 Mazda 323 with rust all over it? Was it because they saw me as a poor person? Was it because they were racist and they saw me and just happened to know what my race may have been? I honestly have no idea. I, 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 I don't know why those things happened. I don't doubt anything that you said. I've heard those stories before. Some of them have, ha have happened to me. I've not been yanked out of my car at gunpoint. I've seen guns before, okay, pointed at me, but not like that. Okay, I've, I've not had anything planted in my car, but I've seen all those things happen, and I, I still, to this day, get pulled over a lot. Look up, okay, speaking of Chicago, you probably never heard of this guy, but look him up. John, J-O-N. Oh, yeah. You know him? Oh, yeah, we know John all John Birch. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying racism isn't a real right. thing or that racism wasn't affecting you. I'm just saying what, what, what you know, ignites me in this regard is when I'm told by someone that I've had it worse than you because of my race. And it's like, it may be that you've had it worse than me, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying those things don't happen to you. Well, sure, but okay? I, I don't know. But, if... but this, listen, this country is not only racist, but it's also based on a caste system, okay? Where lighter skinned black people get better jobs, 
All right. Dark, the darker skin you are, the worse off you are. All right. I'm darker than you are. That's a fact. We can't, we can't even argue that. Okay. You look at, um, for example, you watch the soap operas from the, right. from the, from the eighties and seventies or nineties, whatever. All right. Basically they all were white. It was always a big deal when one of the soap opera people on General Hospital or whatever was going to have a date with a black girl or some uh, white woman was going to have a date with a black man or whatever. That black actor was always light-skinned. Right? To this day, the only act black actress who has received an Oscar for a leading role, leading role, okay, is Halle Berry. Halle Berry is a very pretty girl. She's a very light-skinned black woman, all right? She is not the actress as, say, a Cicely Tyson was, or, or any number of other actresses, all right? It, it, there is a caste system going I, on. I, I, I agree with the caste system in a different way. I, I, I can't speak to the, the skin color, like the lighter skin, like I'm, I wouldn't know. Well, you know, but, you know, I mean, even during times of slavery, it was the lighter skinned blacks who got the jobs in the in in the uh, in the house. I I can say in Brazil, it's, yeah, exactly. It's overt. Yes, it's overt. yes, yes, it it's is. Like I've been to Brazil, Rio yep. de Janeiro, São Paulo, yep. uh, Recife, Bahia, and Brasilia. They straight up yeah. tell you yes, that's how it works. Absolutely. So there was a in India too. There was a story. Uh, a friend of mine who is a uh, he's like half native, half uh, European descendant, Portuguese. And he was saying that he once saw two black men fighting each other over who was blacker as like an insult to each other mm -hmm. because that's the, the culture they have. I will, what, I was, what I will say about the caste system, you know, for me, I think a lot of this has to do, I think class is the bigger issue. Maybe, maybe it's because there's a generational divide and your experiences came from, you know, very much more racist eras. And mine is coming from an era when a lot of these laws are being sort of being, sort of being taken away and stuff or for whatever reason. But uh, I know people who are rich. Mm -hmm. because they're rich. They, I know people who sell garbage to other rich people for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like a piece of jewelry sold between rich people is a, is a, is a net profit of 50 grand for one person. That's and tax I, evasion, my friend. Well, it's something. It's and I'm just, I wonder why it is. I'm like, how do I know people who do so little of anything and they party in, 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 in uh, Switzerland and they party in the Mediterranean on these, on these yachts and these boats and they'll be like, well, you know, work is hard. I sell jewelry. I make about 500000 a year. And I'm like, why, is, why are there jewelers in New York making 50000 a year? Just by virtue of being in the higher class, they have access to people with cash and they make bigger deals, which nets them bigger percentages. So I certainly think there is a, a class system in the United States, but I think the U.S. allows you to navigate it. I think like many other countries don't. The U.S. affords the opportunity to figure out how to, how to work within the system to manipulate and build your way up to get out of these situations. Okay. You know, back in the day, back in the day, when, when black people were first, you know, going to vote and all that kind of stuff, most black people were Republicans. Did you know that? I mean, the first, uh, uh, the first black congressman was Republican, I think, right? You know why? Why is that? Why, why did blacks join the, well, first of all, the Dixiecrats, which became the, the Democrats and stuff. Come up on the mic. Um, yeah. They, okay, the Ku Klux Klan wa was created by that party. All right? So, A, uh, that was a racist party. Blacks gravitated towards Republicans because Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. And Lincoln was the party of Republicans. So they, gra they, they, they admired Lincoln. We went, we went Republican. All right? And that stayed for a long time. And then in the 1960s, a vehement racist named Barry Goldwater opposed the, the Civil Rights Act and all this other kind of nonsense and um, you know, became pretty powerful. And blacks left the Republican Party and went to the Democrat Party, De Democratic Party, which became more liberal and more accepting. And more and more racists began joining the Republican Party. This is in the 1960s, all right? And then it will flip back and forth from time to time. But that's how it, how it modulated. When they say that the parties flipped, it's because of Goldwater? In, in the 60s, it. yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if, uh, if I would look at what's going on right now with Planned Parenthood and with the Democratic Party, that 
they flipped in any meaningful way if they did. I know it's it's argued the right says they didn't, the left says they did. But I, I look at, as I mentioned, Chicago, which has been under Democrat, you know, rule or whatever you want to call it for nearly 100 years, I think. I don't know what point. So uh, you were making an issue about, about Planned Parenthood and you were telling me about um, Margaret Sanger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't finish. Well, so she was a eugenicist. Mm-hmm. She believed only the good should procreate. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had a project that was called... You see, I, I, I hate how YouTube does this, but I have no choice but to call it the N-word project. It, because, but it's not the, the slur. It was mm-hmm. a slur. Mm-hmm. And uh, the goal was to disseminate birth control and contraception and, and, and uh, you know, st- trying to convince them not to have kids for those reasons. Now, there's a debate on the quotes from this woman because some of them are extremely egregious. And then the left claims they're not real quotes. So whatever, I'll leave that out of it, I suppose. But if the goal of Planned Parenthood started by this woman was to prevent black people from having kids. And to this day, you you mentioned the white population is decreasing, but the black population is stagnant. Mm -hmm. It seems like her ideas to stop black people from having babies worked. And now you can look at 2006 data I pulled up that black women are five times more likely to have abortions than white women. And this is preventing black families and and children from growing up. It sounds like these racists and the Planned Planned Parenthood is overtly defended by the Democratic Party which was the party of racists, they are still enacting policies to hurt black people. When it comes to these like statistics, this is like black crime, black abortion, whatever. Say that there's a five to one what, ratio what, in the what, past. What, what, what is black crime? Let's, yeah, exactly. So in the past, let's say for every one white person that committed a murder, there were five black people when they add the numbers up. Then what they do is they project that past to the future. They'll say, so therefore, black people are five times more likely to commit murder. That, no. no. Then the cops are like, I got to look at every black guy like he's five times more likely. And it's like we're creating a racist Racial projection. Profiling. Yeah. Just because it happened in the past doesn't mean it's going to happen well, I'll again. Tell you, I'll tell you a funny story out of New York. Okay. And then I, then I want to go back to the point I was making. But uh, there was a black cop who went to Central Park and started giving tickets to white couples drinking wine. And he said, public drinking is, is a citation in New York City. And they got all bent out of shape, shape and angry and started complaining. And they were like, we are having wine at our Central Park picnic. How dare you? And he said, white cops come to the black neighborhoods and give young black men tickets for drinking 40s on their own stoops. And you're mad at me because you were publicly drinking in a park. And the city admonished him. And he got in trouble for it. I'm like, that's remarkable bullshit. Get me swearing on the live show. But uh, I wanted to go back to that point because I'm, I'm curious as to your reaction of, you know, what we see out of Chicago, for instance. It's not improved. The, so I, I used to live, wh- where I lived was 49th and Laramie. Are you familiar with the LeClaire Courts? No. It's, 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 it's fascinating and horrifying at the same time. You familiar with Marquette Park? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, the, history, that's... and the history of Marquette Park? It depends on the history, I suppose. I don't know. Marquette Park was originally very racist. Nothing but neo Nazis and KKK oh, wow. people lived there. You didn't know that. No, no, no. no. Yeah, I the, mean, the American Nazi Party was headquartered there. Wow, that wasn't that far away. I mean, right. it wasn't that long ago either. Right, right, right. There's a, so uh, I live on 49th and Laramie. If you walk north two blocks, you get to 47th Street, mm. which as soon as you crossed it, it was a hard racial segregation. Everybody who lived north of 47th was black. Mm-hmm. Everybody south was. For the most part, it was mostly white, like kind of redneck. You know, we had Stickney, the suburb. And so everyone there was kind of just like low income, you know, white people. And then you had uh, Mexican and you had uh, Greek. No, Polish, Polish. Okay. So Movimi Mo- Popolsku everywhere uh, over on Archer. And we weren't allowed to walk north of 47th because the police would detain us. They, they would They would say the only reason you're here is for drugs, get in the car and they would take us back. And so it was fascinating to me that there was this kind of soft enforcement of segregation, that there was a uh, two things happening. There was a choice. People cho- chose to racially segregate. People who moved to the area wanted to live near people who looked like them. Mm-hmm. And that's what and like actually started making prominent racial segregation. And then from there, which it's actually not necessarily from that one point. There's, there's obviously blockbusting and redlining before that. But then you'd end up with police doing profiling. They, they, they'd, they'd see you and say, what are you doing here? Get out. There were a lot of stories I'd hear from uh, white friends of mine, like young girls. Older black men would stop them if they tried to cross 47th. And they would say, young woman, you best not come here. You need to turn around right now. Because they would be in trouble, the black people. Well, no, no, no. Because they were worried about what would happen to the white girls for coming into the black neighborhood. They were like, they're, you know, the, the segregation here, it's, it was violent. They, you know, back in the 60s, 
uh, Martin Luther King himself said Chicago was the most segregated city in this country. I think that's still true. So they, you know, you know what they did? They de they they destroyed the project housing. They just flattened it. Now it's Cabrini an Green. No, this was. Uh, I I don't know if this is specifically the Leclerc courts because the Leclerc courts Le Leclerc courts I think are a different. It's like it's there's a there's a there's a bunch of project housing off of Cicero going all the way down to Central Avenue in Chicago, and I don't know if the entirety of that was the called the Leclerc courts, but there was an area of it. But uh, they just flattened it all. And it was crazy when I, I, one day I decided to look at a Google map of my neighborhood and I saw that all of the housing were, uh, uh, like a lot of the houses are still all, you know, mm -hmm. black owned, black community, but all of the project housing was flattened and they're empty fields with fences saying no trespassing. Mm -hmm. The city just came in and just destroyed it and kicked everybody out. But see, you know, when people look at that and they see this self-segregation and, and they see that it works, they think it's the only way, you know, you know, there's no way people can integrate. And this is not true. It's because of the racism that has been perpetrated and promulgated by this country. It works in other countries. I saw it. I was living 10 years ahead of my time when I was overseas, living in integrated communities, going to integrated schools in the 1960s, not in my country, but overseas. Okay, I was living 10 years ahead of my time because 10 years later, there was diversity in my classrooms here. I know it can work. But when you don't travel, you, you're not exposed to different things. You think you think the world, everything around the world is the same way it is in your neighborhood. You know, my favorite quote of all time is by is by uh, Mark Twain. It's called the travel quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and, and narrow mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. It's so true, man. I went to South America for, I was there for like five, five months or something. And I got a taste of what it felt like to be the other for the mm -hmm. first time in my life. And I don't know if it was the, my race or just the fact that I looked different, but I was walking, you know, people kept looking at me and watching me and it was like unsettling. And I got it. I was like, wow, this is like what people in the United States maybe feel like. When, when they when they feel like in the minority of the amount of people with a similar skin tone or something like and it was just so eye-opening and every I think everyone's got to know they got to know that feeling I want to go to super chats we'll, we'll go a, a few minutes over because we went a few minutes over okay. it's Friday but uh, um, I'm gonna try and just find the good core questions and I apologize you know if we can't get to you but I want I want to tackle some the best questions we can. So smash the like button. If you do like the show, I know a lot of people are, you know, reeing and arguing and yelling at basically everybody. But um, if you like the show and you appreciate the conversations we have, we respect, we appreciate it. You can support us at TimCast.com. But uh, I'll, I'll start with this one from Patriot, who said, I'll say it again. The state of Texas isn't who removed slave from textbooks. It was the board of education dominated by leftists. I don't think you can answer to that, this statement. I think, but I, does, I do think it highlights one of the issues is that if you read a cursory story, it'll say in Texas, they removed this word from the books. And then someone will say, that's not true. It was the other side. You know, how do we navigate when? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to assume that whoever said that is probably correct. Okay. I don't live in Texas. So, but the fact of the matter is in the state of Texas, the word slave was removed from textbooks. But whether, whether the state did it or whether the board of education did it. It was done in the state of Texas. But it does matter who did it and why they did it. Right, right. So, no, so, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about as far as my point goes. The state of Texas removed the word slave from textbooks in, in Texas public schools. Now, who did it? The Board of Education, the state government, whoever. He's probably right. Okay, maybe it was the Board of Education. But it happened in the state of Texas. It I, didn't happen in California or Nevada or Maryland or, or New York or, or wherever. No, but I, but I think the point is that we agree. The issue is when you when you mentioned they put back enslaved people, mm -hmm. I think that well, they, shows... no, no, they 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 replaced it with uh, immigrant worker. Oh, right. And then there was an uproar in the black community. How dare you, you know, uh, water down what happened to our ancestors? They were not immigrant workers; they were slaves. So, but, but is it possible that in the Daryl is misinterpreting? the reason that it was removed and that it was actually mo removed by pro critical race theory well, that's people the, that's that's, 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 that's the situation that's the situation so so i think that like like removing like, master and slave from a coding library github or whatever 
they're getting rid of the word slave because it's offensive to black people. And it's under the guise of progressivism and critical race theory. They're doing it. You know, see, you know, you want to blame things on Democrats, on on Republicans, on critical race uh, proponents. Listen, at the end of the day, you've got to understand something. This country was built on racism. Racism still exists. When I was in elementary school, we had slave auctions. But but you you would you would never do that today. They, they do it today. Progressive teachers. How? A progressive teacher just got fired for a white progressive teacher held a slave auction amongst his students. Is I, I, you you meant like mock in schools, right? Yeah. No. That, that uh, literally no, just no, happened. No, oh, yeah, we no, did a crazy. No, 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 not not mocking. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I read about that. I didn't. I didn't read all into I'm, it. Not but mocking yeah. it. A mock, as in they they practiced. It yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Dude, and they in, shackled yeah. the in black seventh children. grade. Right. Ohio. Exactly. They they were demonstrating something. Okay. But I'm talking about. Uh, they did it in my school. I participated in it. Okay. As a kid, it was a regular thing to raise money. You know. You know. For for whatever re you know school trip or whatever, we would have slave auctions where kids would bid on other kids. You know, it wasn't like white kids bidding on black kids. You know, I, I could bid on some white kid or whatever, all right? And um, you, you paid 50 cents or whatever, and, that, and, and you bought that person, and that person had to carry your books around all day. Well, that, that's not the okay. same thing. We had, yes, we had, it is. It was called a slave auction. No, 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 I'm saying what, what I was referring to. I know, I know what you're referring to. You're, you're referring to a, a reenactment of a slave auction. Right. It, it, it was a yeah. practitioner of right. critical race praxis who segregated the kids by race and then made the black kids wear shackles. When, when I was in seventh grade in 1992, mm -hmm. seventh grade, Ohio, uh, Cairo Falls, Ohio, we did this exercise in like so social studies class where we were all plantation owners, they were mm -hmm. called. Mm -hmm. And we had to either get slaves or indentured servants. And then there was a third type of worker that you would get. Mm -hmm. And you put these little stickers on your board and everyone had their stickers and you go around, you trade stickers with other people. Mm -hmm. So I just did the math and I was like, well, this is cheaper than that. So I got all the right stickers and then won the, the game. But it was just like in indoctrination okay and we weren't slave owners we were called plantation owners right now do, do you remember a lady named uh jane elliott no okay you all need to need, need to look up jane elliott brown eye blue eye you all never heard of that experiment mm -mm. Right, Ooh, you know, i think i may have heard of this okay actually. jane elliott she's, she's a friend of mine and she's still living a lot older now back in the 1960s uh she's a white lady she took her class uh, of uh, white kids and she separated all the brown eyes from all the blue eyes. And she told them that the brown eyed people were superior and blue eyed people were inferior. And guess what? The brown eyed people started acting. These little kids started acting superior. All right. And you would see this, 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 you know, this change. And then and and the and the blue eyed people were feeling inferior and and you know being oppressed. The next day she flipped it around. Oh, it's the blue eyed people who are supposed to be uh, superior, and the brown eyes who are inferior. And they learn more about racism from that. And if you watch interviews with those kids today as adults, they say, "I wish my kids could experience that in school." Hmm. Okay, Let's, Jane Elliott. We'll read some more. The the first thing I want to mention is. Uh, Trock says, where's James Lindsay? Actually, if you'd be interested, I'd love to have a... Uh, James Lindsay knows more about this stuff than certainly I do. I think it'd be a fascinating conversation if you were interested. Sure, invite me. I'll be, I'll be happy to come back. That'd be, sure. that'd be great. We should, we should absolutely... To. I think James is probably... I'm always ready to learn. James is going to be listening to this going, Tim, no, what, you're wrong. Oh, you've missed this point and this quote and this quote. <laughs> and he's going to be saying things like that. All right, so uh, Dragon Stallion says... Is that what it says? Dragon's Talon. Oh... Does your guest feel like black families who own slaves also need to pay reparations? John Kasser was the first lifelong slave in the U.S. owned by a black plantation owner, Anthony Johnson. Do black families need to pay reparations? Those who own slaves. I didn't say any families need to pay reparations. I say the government needs to make those reparations. OK, the people who own slaves are no longer here. I cannot fault you or you for what your great great grandparents did. All right. You need to know about it. You need to know it was wrong, but I'm not going to hold you accountable. 
All right, you're not around. You you were not around then. All right, yeah, I think but, but the government on. needs to make those reparations. And also, it's possible that their parents aren't even from the United States. Well, well that, I mean, whatever. I mean, yeah. even you know, I I know parents who who are from the United States who did have slaves, not parents, but their ancestors. Okay, no, I'm not going to hold their descendants responsible, you know, for for sins of the father or whatever you want to call it. No, but the government needs to make good on it, but and do, they never do, have. That, that was a straw that, man. That was a straw man of what Daryl said about reparations. That you know, it's right. possible to have a nuanced view about reparations that doesn't involve throwing money around but does involve something like edu- a major ed- education yeah. overhaul what like was it? That, absolutely right right but but hold on i mean 898,000 people gave their lives in this country to end slavery and what's your point I mean, you mentioned the Japanese. No one paid. The reason they get paid is because nobody gave their lives to stop that. It was wrong, and they stopped it. You're, you're, you're. This country is the one is the, is the country that won against slavery. That sacrificed nearly a million of its children, saying we we, we we're won against crush slavery. This. You know, let me tell you something. Even today, when you go to schools in the North, when you study the Civil War, you are taught. The Civil War was fought over slavery. In the South, no, 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 no. It wasn't fought over slavery. It was fought over states' rights. Yes, it was fought over states' rights. The states' right to own a slave. They don't put it that way, but that's what it was. It's the same thing. This country is still fighting the Civil War, my friend. I agree. Okay. Why are they still flying Confederate battle flags? Even most young white people don't even realize. You know they don't call it that down there. I know. They call it the rebel flag. I know. Because they rebel against against wanting to give up their slaves. It's also the Civil War is also called the War of Northern Aggression. Right, exactly. And I've heard that Lincoln. It really was an economic war for Lincoln too. He wanted yeah. he couldn't let the states go, uh, take all that money away from the. So, but he said the best way to rally people is to say it's about slavery. And then he also deep down wanted to end slavery. So he kind of tweaked the message. I've heard that. I don't know. But sure. you know they're still fighting that. You know you know fly, flying flying um, Confederate flag Confederate battle flags. Okay. The, the, the crossbar and stars that, you know, that you all call the Confederate flag is not the flag of the Confederacy. That is a Confederate battle flag. That is the flag that flew in the Civil War to battle to maintain slavery. The flag of the Confederacy are the red and white stripes with the blue square with the circle of silver stars. That is the flag of the Confederacy. That crossbars and stars is the Confederate battle flag. But a lot of people want to call it the Confederate flag. Oh, that's awesome. Okay? Yeah, it's true. I just looked it up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so. We how, have a, Huh? I was going to say we have a... Re- I was, I was going to... I didn't know if you were done with your point. I was going to read another comment. Okay, good. So we have a, a few that are, that are bringing up uh, French people owned and sold slaves in Haiti. And Mark says, this man has never heard of French colonies or French Africa. Ask what happened when French African soldiers were brought to Europe in World War One. The accusations made towards them, racism is the unknown. Okay, let me, let, me, let me correct that man right there, and I hope you're listening. Listen, son, I lived in French West Africa for, for, uh, for six years. I lived in Guinea. I lived in Senegal, both which were colonized by the French. So, yes, I do know about French colonies. All Shout right. out to French Indochina Burma. I'll Dude, try to find another one. I just was looking at how the Europeans split up Africa, man. They in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and before that too. It, it was just all. It was just a race to colonize and, and enslave the entire continent. So Colin Burke says one of the bigger problems with reparations that more than 80 percent of even white people moved to the U.S. much later after slavery and half near the end of Jim Crow. So do you comb ancestors or do you call them? Listen. Like, like I said, I'll go back to my point. Whether you moved here yesterday or whether you moved here 500 years ago, nobody is still living today who owned any slaves. All right? So I'm not faulting the descendants of, uh, of slave owners. I am not faulting people who came here yesterday. I am faulting the U.S. government for not doing what they, what they were supposed to do. They gave Japanese Americans reparations. They gave Native Americans reparations. They they promised uh, black people uh, 40 acres and a mule and have done nothing. They haven't even apologized. That's what I'm holding accountable. The majority, do you know what the, without looking it up, do you know uh, uh, who makes up the, the majority of white Americans in this country? What do you uh, do of, of, what, of what descent? Irish. No. No. I- 
That was my guess. No. German. German Americans are, are, are the largest white majority, followed by British Americans. Oh, yeah. I'm German. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm American. But I'm, yeah. some, some drunk boxer was German in my history. Or something. I, I think Daryl's like, envisioning of reparations is actually much more moderate than people might think. In, like, in terms of pure acknowledgement, I th- it seems like that's what you're you're getting at, Daryl. Like you're not necessarily like uh, people people like to have v- different definitions of what reparations are, and you're more so saying you just want clear acknowledgement, which you think. Well, no, I help. want I want an apology, and I think people who have been disenfranchised, uh, held back, and things like that should get something. I'm not saying throw money to them. I'm saying there should be government. Vouchers for for education for to for college tuitions things like that that you know that that we were denied in the past Well, so even even after slavery we couldn't go to Princeton. We couldn't go go wherever so you're you're saying based on race Based on race. So what happens in say the mixed race areas of Southside of Chicago when all of a sudden half the people get vouchers and the other half don't They're all in the same neighborhood same economic status if you are the descendants of slaves, you should be entitled to that, okay? Like if you are the descendants of Native Americans, you got one eighth or one sixteenth of Native American blood in you, you can get something. If you if you are a survivor of the internment camps or your or, or your descendants are of the Japanese internment camps, you can get something, okay? So descendants of slaves should be entitled to what they were promised and they never received, just like um the the uh, the courts awarded the the uh, the survivors of the Tulsa uh, race massacre and their descendants something and to this day they haven't got it. So so my question was, what do you think would happen to the mixed race neighborhoods when only half the people get vouchers, get some kind of benefit or resource? Nothing would happen. Why, why would anything happen if if they're not entitled to it? They're not they're not entitled to it. Should 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 some I suppose, guy? I suppose it's like. Well, wait a minute. I mean, listen. If somebody came over here yesterday from Nigeria, okay, yeah, he looks the same as I do. But he's not entitled to what to what I to, to what I should get. He didn't go through that. His ancestors didn't go through that. Okay, so it's just like you know somebody comes over from from Japan tomorrow. Do they get something that that's owed to to the uh, survivors and descendants of the people from the Japanese internment camps? No. Let's say somebody is the uh, descendant of uh, a, a man and woman come from Afghanistan with a, with a child after their country was completely just destroyed. And that kid is in, 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 living in poverty in a neighborhood. And then all of a sudden the government comes in and hands out checks based on race that they're not entitled to. And they say, well, your oppression doesn't count because we're only talking about other oppression. The issue I have with race-based distribution of resources, one, the resource has to be paid for by somebody. The government doesn't have money. The government taxes the people. And then the, it uses the people's resources to distribute where it wants to. I think the problem is the problem is if we, we use race based programs to give people money, it's just still why, racial segregation. Why, why is it, Tim, that you know you haven't said anything about that as far as Japanese people go? Okay, they're still getting, uh, they're still entitled to money, and they. But I, but I did. Yeah, but hold on. I did. They, they can still they can still get money. Yeah. Native Americans to this day can still get money. Okay, how come I can't get money? Okay, not not, not that I'm going to to go to go look for it or whatever. Okay. We have been denied it. So you're okay with this group getting it. You're okay no, with that group getting it. But but now never, when it comes to that. black people, now you come up with all these excuses no, about so and so died in the war. You know, isn't that enough? Or no, they you know they should not get money because this person isn't getting money. No, ha- I, I didn't say it was okay that we're giving people money for, based on race. I think it's wrong to get. I, just, I literally said it was wrong to distribute not, resources. Not, based no, on no, race. no, no. Listen, I'm not saying give people money based on race. I'm saying give money people based on the crime you committed against them. What if so? Like to, so, so if they have one ancestor who was enslaved, if they had one ancestor who was enslaved, are they entitled to it? I would say so. Yeah. So you're, okay, you'll, but, but you'll, you'll end up see, seeing a lot of white people get those vouchers, huh? You'll end up with a lot of white people getting those vouchers. There weren't that many white people who were enslaved. No, okay? there, but there are white people who are the descendants of slaves. Like if there was a a, a, a black slave who found themselves in an interracial relationship. And now this person is one sixty fourth black or one eighth or one. I mean, there 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 are people who uh, a famous actor. I'm not going to use their name. Who is you know I think one eighth black, and no one realizes it because he just looks like a white guy. But he'd get one of these checks, and he's a rich white dude. 
That makes sense. It would you in order to be consistent, it would have to be like that. Yeah, the rich white yeah, guy gets his check too. To truly repair Will the Smith, system, he's like, rich. If he the gets idea it. is uh, reparation, I'm not, which means to repair, then I don't think haphazardly handing money at people. We need to build holistic systems that lift everyone up together, like decentralized technology. And I'm not going to derail guys into that. Don't worry about it. But I feel like when you can do things that everyone benefits from clean water supplies and like free internet access with satellites and stuff like that, then everyone has an opportunity to better themselves. You can't throw $80,000 in someone's face and expect them to be better. I don't think Will Smith's family should get free money, should get money from the government. I just don't understand it. If he, if if Will Smith's family were, were descendants of slaves, yeah, I I do, and I think I think so, so should my family. We should we should we should receive something for for the crime that was perpetrated upon us that split my family apart. My ancestors were, were you know we we don't have nuclear families, okay? Well, you know, your, your name is Tim Pool. Where where does that name come from? Uh, it's fake. Okay, well, then I want so to ask, I want to ask uh, you what your uh, real name is. The, the lore of my family is that they were uh, uh, bandits who created a fake name after uh, getting into a train robbery that murdered somebody. Okay, so that's so, awesome. Okay, yeah. so, all right, so we won't, we won't go there. All right, so so Mr. Ottman here, okay? Riverman. Riverman. Okay, Riverman Ottman. Where, where does the name Ottman come from? I actually, well, I can tell you one interesting lineage fact. Uh, I'm actually, so my mother's name is Ball, middle name, British maiden name. name, Ball, George Washington's mother, Mary Ball. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually, uh, George Washington is my direct cousin, seven generations removed. So Rufus that Putnam. is what it's it is. It's a, British, it's a British, Ball is a British name. Yeah, but I, I'm, okay, I'm so a mutt. Now, I'm a mutt. M- m- huh? I'm a mutt of well, all okay, of Well, the, whatever. Okay, so this man right here can go to Britain and find some balls and find some people, some balls who are related. <laughs> oh, you know he will. We're kids. We're children. <laughs> Lots we're of them. <laughs> There's a lot okay, of them out there. I'm sure there are. Uh, I got a couple of them. Now, um, he can go there and find some balls that he is distantly related to. All right? My name is Davis. Do you know where the name Davis comes from? Jefferson Davis. I have no, no idea. Okay. Davis is a Welsh name, all right? Do I look Welsh to you? No, okay? The name, okay, slaves took the names of their plantation owners, their owners, okay? If they, because the, the, the plantation owners could not pronounce their real names, number one, all right? So, you know, the name Davis came from the Davis Plantation in North Carolina, all right? Now, if they did not like their plantation owner, and most of them didn't, they took names when slaves were freed. They took names of people that they did like, or people who had higher uh, positions, like presidents or free men, right? And free men. Okay. Yeah. Now, most people that you find that you see today who are named Jefferson, or who are named Washington, or who are named Lincoln, are mostly black people. Yes, there are some white Jeffersons. You know, a few, a few white people are named Washington, but I'll guarantee you. Nine out of ten people you meet with the last name of Washington or Jefferson is going to be a black person. Okay, so, and they took that name because their names were stripped from them. All right, their 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 mothers and fathers were. We we didn't have nuclear families. Okay, I cannot. You know, I I lived in West Africa. I lived in Senegal, where Gore Island is. Gore Island was where the slaves came from. They they were locked up and chained in Gore Island, put on the boat. All right, I've been to Gore Island. I've seen those slave quarters. All right. I cannot go to Senegal or West Africa and find somebody named Davis. I can go to Wales. I played in Wales with my band, okay? And just at, for fun, I said, anybody out there named Davis? Half the people started screaming. The name Davis in Wales is as popular as the name Smith is over here. So I'm like, hey, cuz, how y'all doing out there? You know? So we were stripped of our identity. We can't get that back. But we are owed something for the crimes perpetrated upon us. I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna read w- uh, some critical ones. I think some of the others were already critical, but uh, this one's just overtly critical. Fine. Deli Opla says this conversation has been really effing disappointing. Daryl's antics today have done more to radicalize me than de-radicalize me. Well, apparently he's already radicalized. I well, think that it's, right? it's undeniable that this is exactly the type of conversation that needs to happen. And the fact that, you know, Tim, you're getting like I saw the SPLC thing coming out like 
for 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 them to accuse your show of not having cross spectrum conversations is completely ridiculous. This is that. Well, that's why the smear was like he gets bad super chat sometimes, and it's just like the Southern Poppy Law Center tried. They don't like, like me either. Yeah. You know, did you ever see uh, my documentary, Accidental Courtesy? No, no. Oh, uh, you should check it out. I, I know that uh, there are a lot of people on the left who don't like you. Yeah. And I think I think it might be because you've you've actually helped to de-radicalize people. I think these these nonprofits that make money off racism don't want racism to go away. Here, here's what I think. I think there's a generational difference between us. We've 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 talked to uh, a couple other boomers, you know, uh, in the past, and it seems like the way we consume as millennials and younger information. You should ask that guy why is he radicalized in the first place. I'd be interested in his response. Well, it's because. When you look at the, the older generation, it seems like they've abandoned the millennials. That's how it feels, I think, to a lot of millennials. They, uh, we recently had a guest who said feminists are not pro-war. And it's like, here we are as millennials online talking to millennials, and the f feminist millennials are all overtly the Ukrainian flags, defending intervention, defending NATO's intervention. And we're like, we don't want this. The boomers in their world is completely different. Little stink bug. Yeah. So I think for a lot of people, it feels like when we hear from the older generation, they're detached from the world we live in and they don't understand what we're experiencing. And so it <laughs> frustration. It's, yeah, it's, frustration. It's funny and, because, you know, you say that, but I can say the same thing. Um, you know, being the older generation from you guys, you have no clue what we went through. Yeah. What I feel like what's happening is you're well, exposing a sort of truth, a perspective truth. And I'm reading this Galileo quote, the truth. All truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Maybe you'll see that in the Super Chats. Mm -hmm. Second, it's violently opposed. Usually you, you see that in the Super Chats. Then it's accepted as being self-evident. Okay, so let me tell you about Galileo. And I'll tell you about, um, but before Galileo, his, um, his mentor, his, uh, his person that he looked up to was another astronomer who you've heard of called Copernicus. All right? Copernicus said that the earth revolves around the sun, okay? That is a, um, a heliocentric uh, theory. The world said no, because, you know, we were egocentric. We thought we, the earth was the center of the universe and the sun revolved around the earth. And they called Copernicus a heretic, and they locked him up in prison for saying that. Guess what? He was right. A hundred years later, Galileo, Galileo comes, or, comes along and he had studied Copernicus and Galileo came to the same conclusion that we are not geocentric, we are heliocentric, all right? And the earth revolves around the sun, all right? They called him a heretic, but guess what? Galileo was right. I want to read the super chat. Uh, Kid Funky Fry says, I think my great great grandpa who was blown apart to free the slaves was payment enough, especially considering I or no one in my family has ever owned slaves. So there's a couple of questions I get out of this is interesting. So if this man is telling the truth and his uh, an ancestor died uh, to end slavery and his family never owned slaves, if we do reparations, should we also create an exception that anybody who is who is uh, not descendant of slave owners is exempt from the tax that would fund the reparations. Anybody who is who is not a descendant of slaves would have a tax credit exemption from any taxes that would go towards reparations. I'd have to think about that, but I, but you know, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you know it doesn't matter that that his ancestors died uh, fighting in the Civil War. Okay, you know, you 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 go and you fight for your country. You go and you fight for your land. Like, listen. An American just died the other day over in Ukraine. Okay, that was his choice to go there and fight. All right. Uh, so, do, you know, do, do, does his family get uh, some kind of reparations? You know, I, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. We fought against Japan. Do do these people? Th these people still get uh, reparations. You know, wh why? Why is it cut off uh, when? Um, when black people don't get don't get any reparations, black black people who are descendants of slaves, that is the racism, and I'm calling that guy who just wrote you a racist. Why is he racist? Why is he racist? Because he does he does not see the racism that was perpetrated by his country 
against people like me and my ancestors. Thank you for your grand for your great grandfather's service for fighting in the Civil War against slavery. But if you can't see that black people in this country have not received the the same um, apology for one and the same reparations for another that Japanese Americans have received and that Native Americans have received, well, I don't, something is wrong, I don't you're think, blind. I don't think he's saying that. I think he's just saying that for you to say that he should pay. I didn't say he should pay. What did I say? I well, said well, the well, government well, should pay. But the government takes money from him. The, listen, we all pay taxes. Right, right, right. So if, the, so if we all pool our money together for, say, the common defense and services, and then you step up and say, I want to take from that pool because of reparations, he's... He says, okay, well, hold on. My, my family member died for you. Is, is that enough? You say, no, you're a racist. I think that's kind of- I mean, of, you can't, you also, kind of, just because you're anti-reparations does not mean that you're racist. There are many black people who are not- He didn't say anything. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about him. I'm, saying I'm just, all, I'm, I'm all, saying- all, as, as, for, as, for you to call him a racist when he's simply saying, don't take from me. I'm not taking from him. But I don't are, think you okay? can call, you no, can't listen, call hold someone hold on, a racist on, over, over listen, like that. We all, I mean, I'm calling him a racist. But you don't and know I, him, Daryl. I'm calling him a racist and I'm standing behind what I say. And listen, we all have to pay taxes. When you drive down the road, you are not allowed to use the HOV lane if you don't have two people in your car or HOV three, three people in your car. If you are riding by yourself and you drive down that lane, you will get a ticket if a cop sees you. All right. I, I've done that and I've gotten a ticket. All right. Not because I'm black, but because I was driving down the HOV lane with one person, me, in the car. All right. Guess what? I pay taxes and my taxes built that road. What if he okay, said, why, why can't I use that lane? Can he get reparations for his great grand, great, great grandfather dying? Should the government pay him for the loss of his grandfather? I Right now, I'm talking about black descendants of slaves. Okay. Now, if he wants to get reparations from from the government because his great great grandfather died, you know that's his fight. Convince me, and I and I and I will stand behind him. But do you think that if he went to the government and said I should, and the government said yes, and they took tax money and gave it to him, tax money that you pay, would you be okay with that? Not if I'm not getting any reparations. No. Well, then why should he? After his because, great grandfather because, died, well, think you, that he you should miss, give his you're tax. Miss, you're missing the point. Well, I, I, because they, because when it comes to giving black people something. You all are saying, no, cut it off here. No, no, it stops that's, here. we're not. That's not. Bullshit. Because you, you've already acknowledged Japanese Americans are getting it. Uh, Native Americans are getting it. So what was, is I the said problem? It was wrong. I said it was wrong. Well whether, it's, well, whether you say it's wrong or not. I said they, racial disbursement of well, money hold is on. wrong. Whether, it's, whether you say it's wrong or not, it's happening. What, right. are, you, what are you doing to stop it? I, I do a show where I say it's wrong. Oh, well, that's not stopping it, is it? I mean, I vote. It inspires other people to vote. It's, it has an influential impact on people sharing uh -huh. ideas. Well, the, we well, allow the, well, people the, the, to the point talk is, to us and share okay, ideas. What, once, once everybody, okay, should should the people who who um, first first of all, well, hold, hold, should, should the descendants of the Tulsa race uh, race riot, the the Black Wall Street descendants, should they get reparations? To, I, I, from the people who committed the atrocities, maybe people in that in the your people who committed the atrocities are, are dead. So the, then, what do you do? Do you punish the living, the sins of the father? See, the issue I have with this is that did, did, I, did I say punish? What, what did I say? Well, I, I, the I, money I, has I said to specifically come from somewhere. the sins of the father. Who is paying for it? Who takes? Who, the who U.S. From? government pays for it, whether it comes out of your taxes or whether it comes out of their Fort Knox or wherever it comes from. The U.S. government pays labor. for it. It would be the Federal Reserve. They'd print a bunch of money, and then it would have caused inflation. Yeah, right. And, right. Right. So I think why they haven't done the it. Poor. Yeah. Well. Well. You know what? Why didn't people think about that before when uh, when when they were murdering uh, Indians and murdering? But those uh, things are all bad. Like yeah, the, yeah. The, but but, but, the, point, but the point is, but the point is, you keep driving home. This, this is where I draw the line. You know what you're saying, Tim, is racist, whether you are or whether you're not. I think it's you're racist. racist. Well, that's fine. You can think yeah. whatever you want to think. I don't care. My point is, when it comes to uh, uplifting black people, the line is drawn. No, nobody, it stops. nobody said that. I, did I say anybody said it? You I, said we all did several times. I said what you're saying is wrong. But, I said when it comes to uplifting black people, the line is drawn. When it comes to uplifting this person, that person, that person, I it's already been done. I wasn't it's alive. Been done. I wasn't alive. It doesn't matter whether you were alive or not. When, it happened. So I wasn't alive when they interned Japanese people. My family actually suffered because I come from an Asian background and they were spit on and treated horribly. No doubt. And... Uh, 
The only thing I can say is that I was born into a world with problems and we advocate for solving those problems. But I don't think that racial policies solve those problems. I think that's what we're fighting against. Yeah, I'm we're fighting against the government creating racial segregation because we want people to come together and live together and work together. And so what we end up seeing is. OK, so how people do people of, come together when this person has ten dollars and that one only has 50 cents? And, well, this, that's, and this one keeps well, getting ten dollars well, and that one only gets Well, so 50 this is cents. why I said I think it's a problem that they disperse money based on race. I wasn't alive when they started. I didn't say disperse money based on race. I said disperse money based upon those people who have suffered from crime due to racism. OK, but they, that, that, but that means white people, a lot of white people. A lot of white them. people committed those crimes. No, they'll get the money. A lot of white people who are overtly white with blonde hair and blue eyes still have slave ancestors. I'm not saying millions. Then fine. Then but fine. I, I just I just don't agree with giving white people reparations. No, money. you want to give people opportunity, like, not money. Money could be part of it. Did I it say money? To, no, I, I no, said you said intuitions. it doesn't have resources. to be money. Right. Re right. Resources. Like, the idea that we're going to try and like, you're going to see some you know rich white family who's like, you know, actually, one of our ancestors was a slave. We're 164th, and that person was a part of our family. And then all of a sudden, this waspy family is like getting a voucher for college. Yeah, that's what I want to avoid. I think that the only way we can do it is uplift everyone together. I think if you can create software or some sort of technology that allows people with or without money to create a business, to start their own entrepreneurial ship and get subscriptions from people, then you're uplifting everyone because a lot of times it's the poor that are suffering right now. If someone's I, like you said, you wouldn't take money if there was a system like this where they're handing out checks, or you just said earlier you wouldn't. I don't know, right? Because right. you don't need it. But these what, people what, that need it, what, they need opportunity. Well, what about what about uh, tax credits? What about like a tax break or something like that? There are many different things that, that can be um, given in in lieu of uh, of money. Maybe a tax credit, maybe a tuition. You know, I'd have to think that through, or have other people who have more intelligence than I do think it through. All right. But something needs to be done and nothing has been done for the descendants of slaves. That is my point. OK, something has been done for the descendants of Native Americans. Something has been done for the descendants of Japanese Americans. But when it comes to people who look like me, the line is drawn. We have never even received an apology for slavery. Do you Telling me slavery is wrong. Well, shit. So what? OK, yeah, it's wrong. But telling me. We're sorry it happened is a whole different thing. Is affirmative action something to assist in this in this way? It's 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 overtly race based. Uh, 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 affirmative action has many different definitions, just like critical race theory. I don't like I said before with affirmative action. I do not believe in lowering the bar of standards. I believe in keeping the bar up, and people aspire to hit that bar, not lower the bar so people can reach it. Keep it up. I believe in affirmative education where everybody has the opportunity to better themselves and go out and get better jobs, okay? As you mentioned, give people opportunities. They don't have the opportunities if, they, if they're not educated. When, when I think and, about and, and even, even those people who are educated, like myself, okay, I still experience discrimination when it comes to jobs. Yeah, people need to learn how to run their own business as a young kid, regardless of where they go to school or their age or any of that stuff. People need to learn that stuff. You know, when I think about apologizing for slavery, I have a hard time be doing it for real because it's horrible. Like to enslave humans is horrific. The Uyghurs in China, that's horrific that this computer was made by slaves in part. But like if it hadn't happened the way it happened, we wouldn't be here. And that I like that we're here. So I wouldn't change it. I mean, maybe if I could go back and say, no. It, it wasn't a slavery. Maybe it would have been conquered by, you know, the Mexicans or the Portuguese or like who knows where we'd be. So it's that's why I have a hard time just outright giving like a genuine like I'm, I'm sorry it happened because it, it didn't happen to you. Um, so I want to apologize to if I saw somebody. I don't know, man. Let me let me give you an example of something. OK, true story. I was giving a lecture at uh, at Michigan State University some years ago in Lansing, Michigan. All right. And um, this uh, white girl, you know, we're talking about apologies and stuff. And she says, you know, wh why should we apologize? Now, she's, she was not a racist. OK, what she was saying was racist, but she was not a racist. I could see that. She's like, why? Sh why should we apologize? I mean, I wasn't around when slavery was happening. Nobody in my family owned slaves. I why should I apologize for what my great, great, great ancestors did? You know, I, I, I wasn't responsible for that. And I said, the apology is symbolic. Nobody is around, 
All right? It's just, you know, you give medals posthumously. It's symbolic. All right? People cannot move forward until they have received an apology for wrongdoing to them. And I said to her, I said, listen, it, it was in November when I was lecturing out there. Um, I said, okay, let's say I'm a student here at, uh, at, 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 uh, at Michigan State. I said, and I live in the dorm, and I, and I live, you know, on the East Coast. You live here in Michigan, and you, say, and, and you and I are friends, and you say to me, hey, are you, are you going home for Thanksgiving? And I say, no, I, I can't afford to go home for Thanksgiving. I'm going to save my money and go home for Christmas vacation. Okay, and, and, then, and then you tell me, oh, well, you know, my, 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 my grandparents told me, you know, if I wanted to, I could ask some of my uh, students you know, who weren't going home if they wanted to come over for Thanksgiving dinner. You know, would you like to come? And I say, sure. Okay, so now I'm invited to her grandparents for Thanksgiving. So she comes by my dormitory, picks me up, takes me over to her grandparents' house, along with some other students. Now, let's say her grandfather didn't realize that she was going to bring a black student to home. This guy's a little older. He makes some racist remarks or whatever that offends me. I said to her, I said, what are you going to say to me on the way back to the dorm? And she said, I'm going to say, I I'm sorry about what my grandfather said. I said, but you know what? You didn't make that remark. Your grandfather did. You are apologizing for your ancestor. I said, it, it, now, I said, I can't change how your grandfather feels, okay? But I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge that it's wrong and you say you're sorry but for a, it. A real I got apology I, would be to confront the grandfather as it happens and be like, dude, we're in the 21st century. Grow up. Look at the eyeballs. I want to read some more Super Chats. So there's a bunch that are saying very similar things. So I, I, I'm not going to read... I'm just going to give the general ideas. There's two uh, interesting ideas. Um, many people have said that they think you're a racist. Fine. And uh, a couple right here. We have one from Kyle. We have one from Kevin D. Uh, who both said, I'm white. Uh, uh, Kyle says, as a white dude, I've had the talk. I'm pretty sure everyone has the talk. Kevin says, I'm, I'm white, grew up in the middle class family in a suburb in Los Angeles, and I had the talk. And others have said that, they think your view of the talk being explicitly a black thing shows that you've been I didn't say explicitly. Well, you said it's something that black families do. I said black families do it. I didn't say explicitly. Well, That's your word. Well, so the general idea that I guess people absorbed by that is that you think it's exclusive. Listen, I never said it was exclusive. But, I didn't well, use right. the word exclusive. I didn't use the word explicit. Well, so then we can clarify. I said it. black families give their boys when they turn 16 something called the talk. I said black families do that. Did I say did I say black families do it exclusively? Well, no, no, no. Did I so, say black families do it right, explicitly? Right. So no, I did not. So that guy is is, is uh, putting people. words in my mouth. Well, no, no. What, so I guess the idea they're conveying is that when you say black families do it, they interpret you as saying as if it's not happening elsewhere. Guess what? Black families listen to James Brown. Does that mean no white people listen to James oh, Brown? I listen well, no, to no, James no. So, Brown. So okay, can, so 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 do black families exclusively listen to James Brown? Well, so you're, you're clarifying. I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying. I'm I'm, cl I'm clarifying his BS. Is what I'm I'm calling BS on him. Now, white. Well, well, hold, well, 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 hold on, hold on. Let, let, let me tell you about the talk. Okay, the talk that that black kids get is the one that I described about the same one that you described about keep your hands on the wheel, don't argue, sign the ticket, we'll fight it in court. Okay, otherwise, you know, you could come home in a box. All right. Well, so now a lot of white people get the talk, but most of the uh, of the white people that get the talk is a different talk. How do you know? Because I have a lot of white friends. Okay, who tell me? So, all right, I have a lot of black friends who tell me. Well, something. that's fine. Okay, I mean, but, that, that makes but, no but sense. But hold on, that makes no sense. You haven't even heard what I said. You, well, you're, you're, you're generalizing me off based on race. Huh? You're generalizing based on race. You said you had a lot of black friends. I was making a sarcastic point to counter your racist point. You haven't, uh, no, you haven't even let me finish my point. So, okay. So, oh, hold, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to finish my point. Okay. A lot of white kids get the talk, but it's not the same talk as the black kids get the talk because they don't have the same experiences. The talk that, the, that a lot of the white kids get is when they start driving, don't get pregnant. Don't come home pregnant. Use condoms. You know, I don't want to be a grandfather or grandmother before my time. I think that's the talk that a lot of white kids get. Yeah, now, we, we, I, now we, I challenge, I challenge you. Hold on, I challenge you to. You say you have a lot of black friends. Great. No, 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 no. Uh, hold on. I know for, you're being. Well, maybe you don't have any, but but find, but find some. Okay. Okay. Well, hold, hold on. on. Hold, hold on. Hold my, on. I want to. I, I'm going to clarify that. When you made a racist generalization, I made a sarcastic point. What not was about my, my racist gener generalization? That you have a lot of white friends, therefore you know what white people in general do. 
Did I say I know what white people in yeah, general yes, do? Yes, you did. I said, I said, most white kids get this talk. No, I didn't they say don't. all white. Yes, they do. You don't know yes, that. They do. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Did you grow up in a white family in a suburb? I grew up in white neighborhoods. When we have I went people, to white schools. When we have I know, people ex saying us to us right now, it's not their experience. And you say, well, they're racist and wrong. You're, I didn't say they're racist and wrong. You called the guy racist. I, you I overtly said, said this man was racist. I said what he said was racist. I didn't say he was a racist. Okay, that, that, no, okay, no, but, but this is a key. No, hold this on, is a key. No, Daryl, I haven't spoken in a while. I need to say Go something. <laughs> Seriously, we need to stop overtly calling people racists. I, think. I will call I, a person I, a racist if I see that they no, are no, a racist. No. Well, I'm just, saying, or I'm just saying at this table, I know and love you all. And I know for a fact that nobody at this table is a racist. A hundred percent. Maybe certain racial comments can be made, but I know that for a hundred percent, like a hundred percent. So, so the fact that like these names are getting thrown around, I just, I don't think it's really productive. Well, I'm not saying you can't look, call look. someone racist. I'm not saying racists don't exist, I'm, but I think we need to be very careful. All this dude said is as a white dude, I've had the talk. I'm pretty sure everyone has the talk. Well, see, he's pretty sure everyone has the talk. So now you're going to defend him. He's pretty sure everyone has the talk. But uh, yeah, when I, if, if, but you accuse me of saying all white people and now I'm a racist and I don't know shit, but he says well, everyone and you're not defending him. Well, let me explain. When he says everyone, he means you too. Every, everyone has the talk? I know a lot of people haven't had the talk. Well, sure. A sure. lot of white people haven't had the talk. Well, the sure, talk. sure. But, but now you're just getting semantics. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm reacting to what he said. So this he, started, he said everyone and so, you didn't get on him, but you got on me for saying a lot of white people. Because I don't like the racist generalizations. Like, I don't, I don't like listen, it when someone says one race does one thing. This country is based on race, okay? There is only, listen, I believe there's, there is only one race. It is a human race, okay? One race. You and I are the same race. Ian and I, Bill and I are the same race. We all are the same race, the human race. But this country has divided us by color. And if you don't believe that, you need to go back and learn your history, which you apparently have not learned if you don't see that. And if they don't see that. This country is predicated but, but, on race. But we this country was you. built on like, white supremacy we, we're, we're, and slavery at we, the bottom. So I think a lot of people, especially me, we agreed with you with like so much of the historical problems and racism and civil rights and all that stuff. But you think it's all over. No, I, I literally said that wasn't. So what's your point? So when you say something that is r dividing people based on race and people take issue with it, you... You, you re recoil, you call them do racist. You, do you not see this country dividing people based on race? You think we, we live in a post-racist society because we had a black president or something? A lot of white people no, think I, that I too. I've heard, I've heard white people say, racism is over. You know, we, we, we've had Obama. Well, but I'm, we're not saying that. I'm, I'm saying, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I'll just say triggered me was this idea that there are certain things you've suffered that are either described only as a black experience or uh, in this instance when people felt when you said black families give their kids the talk the response was them saying I'm white and I've had the talk and some people saying they feel like that was you showing you're radicalized to a racial as a racial component uh, well that's pretty that's pretty stupid and that's pretty racist so I just called somebody stupid and I just called them racist so now, now hold on I can speak as a black man so why is it when I say um, I, as a black man, got the talk. I am racializing something. Because I am black. That is my sense. said experience. white people do X and you're not a white person. I didn't say white people do X. I said, you did. I said I'm black. And you said I white have, people have a different talk. They yes, do this. Yes, they do. You can't speak as a white person, can you? I can speak. I can repeat what white people have told me. But you don't, are, are, you, are you denying that white people have told me that? Are you calling them liars? I, that's not. No, I, that's I, I'm not asking here. you that question. That has nothing to do with what we're talking no, no, about. No, no, answer yes or no. Are you calling the, 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 my white friends liars? I'm calling them anecdotal. Anecdotal. Oh, uh -huh. so, so you're saying that, that, that they, they did not have the talk that I told you that they had. No, no, no. Anecdotal means you heard a I few stories. I know what stories. anecdotal right. means. So the issue is if you have your stories and they have their stories, it's a moot point. Meaning, no, it's not a some, point. some white people experience the talk in great degrees. And have you experienced have. everything I've experienced? No, no, it's no. What you're saying and is, vice versa. Yeah, dude, it's evidence. What you're saying is evidence. And then what these guys saying is evidence. None of it proves anything. But we're all given our anecdotal what mean, evidence. What do you mean? It doesn't prove anything. Well, like our statements today, us, we, whatever you say and whatever I say, it doesn't prove it. It's just a piece of evidence towards the, the, the postulation. I don't understand what you mean. It doesn't prove anything. If I tell if, OK, okay so he tells me that he got pulled over at gunpoint and he got handcuffed and some guy tried to plant Adderall in his car. 
I just said it's a moot point. It, it, it you know it, it didn't happen. It's just an oh editor. no! Well, that would be evidence that there is more crime towards people like him in that area, or no, something it's like just that. that. It wouldn't happens. prove that it's always more crime towards people like him in that area. It doesn't prove it, but it's evidence suggesting that it's real. And I think you saying suggesting that it's real, it is real. He experienced it. A, yeah, I don't and, doubt it's that actually he experienced on video. that. It's actually on yeah, video. Yeah, but when you, listen, when you speak for the greater video, whole, when it's on I'm, video or not. I believe it happened to you yeah. because that crap was happening long before you were born. So let's, okay, so I don't need the video so to know that it ha- you, you know why I know it happened yeah. because it happened to me. Not at gunpoint. Similar things. I've been hearing about that shit long so, before, so, long before video, b- before anybody had video cameras so, other than TV stations. When you say you experienced something, like the talk, or a white person told me the talk, and then a white person from their own personal experiences say that this is what happens to me, why would they be wrong or racist? Did I say they were wrong? Listen, there are white people, yes, who get to talk, keep your hands on the wheel. You know, don't argue with the cops, whatever, all right? But there are also plenty of white kids who get to talk, don't come home pregnant, use condoms, all right? We get to talk when we get stopped by the police, when we start driving, obey the speed limit. Don't do anything to raise suspicion to cause somebody to pull you over because... the. Here, here, hold on, hold on. Let me say that doesn't happen to other people. Like it was. It does not happen with the frequency. Like I told you earlier. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm telling you the frequency. Okay, which you which you debated with me and and was the first time you called me a racist. I told you that I have been pulled over more times than you have, and I have. Whether you whether you want to accept it or not, that's that's objectively true. You're older than me too. It doesn't matter. I I still have, even if you and I were the same age. Okay. In the last five years. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Now, I want you to do something, both of you, and you too if you want. Here's an experiment, okay? You said you had some black friends, I I assume you do. You you also have some white friends. I want all of you all, ask 10 of your white friends, male friends, what is the first thing, and, and you people out there listening, you do the same thing. Ask 10 of your white male friends, what is the first thing that goes through your mind When you're driving home late at night, let's say two o'clock in the morning, whatever, from a date or from getting off work, whatever, and and you see those those lights come on in your in your rearview mirror, those flashing lights, you're being pulled over. Maybe you were speeding, maybe you weren't, maybe you cross swerved, whatever, maybe you didn't, whatever. You're being pulled over. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? I will bet you, ten out of ten or nine out of ten of those white males, your friends, are gonna say. I hope I don't get a ticket. I hope I don't get uh, points on my license. I hope my insurance doesn't go up. You ask the same question to 10 of your black male friends, they're not going to say anything about a damn ticket or points on the license or insurance. They're going to say, I hope I don't get shot. I hope I don't get beat up. Why because there, Because there is a more frequency of violence against black male drivers than white male drivers. Okay? Just like... There is more of a frequency of blacks being sentenced to death and and whites for the same crime get to go to prison for life or life with parole. Okay, that is called racism. And that's why black people get that talk. I'm not saying white people don't get the talk, but black black people's lives are more in danger. And that's why Black Lives Matter was uh, was created okay i'm not saying i i'm, I'm a proponent of, of of that movement or whatever i'm just telling you why it was created okay because of, of of the things that were happening to black people where they were not happening to white people in the same um uh situation well black lives matter was started over trayvon martin that's right and zimmerman's a hispanic guy and the uh, uh, uh zimmerman he is of hispanic descent but Zimmerman enjoyed what is called white privilege. That's critical race theory. The idea that, that white that's people— That's your definition of critical race theory. Well, Kimberly theory. Crenshaw, I, I, I can pull it up right here for you. Listen, the, that's your definition of critical whiteness race Whiteness as theory. property, in which she described how passing led to benefits a kid to owning property. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is Cheryl L. Harris in the Harvard Law Review. And uh, citation for it is Crenshaw et al. 1995. So— um, this idea that because Zimmerman, I mean, I, I disagree. I don't think he looked white. I think he looked like a Mexican guy. And uh, further, the news lied about what Zimmerman did. NBC edited his phone call to make it seem like he was racially profiling when he wasn't. So the narrative that emerged from that was actually fabricated. Okay. Do you remember 
Well, you're probably too young for that, but but you know about it. The O.J. Simpson trial? Yeah. Do you remember O.J.'s picture on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek? No. Okay, well, then you guys need to research that, okay? Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine came out the same day. Time Magazine intentionally darkened O.J. Simpson's picture, mm -hmm. darker than his skin tone, because the we blacker you are, the more evil you are. There you go. Wow. Voila. That is racism. Yeah. I, I don't give a damn we, what we, you all say. You can call agree. it critical race theory. You can call it whatever the hell you want to call it. That is racism. That is what this country is predicated upon, we, to turn white people against people of darker skin. And that's why I get pulled over more than you and more than you hold on. and more than, than, than your 10 white friends. But Newsweek didn't darken his skin? Well, I can't tell. Did you see, listen, you know, you can argue all you want. There's your picture right there. One, one is showing a one is showing, version what, of the One is showing O.J. Simpson uh, in, in his real skin tone, and the other one is showing him darkened. And Time Magazine did that intentionally. But Newsweek didn't. I don't know if they did or not, but look at that. Yeah. Okay. That that's how I know O.J. Simpson. I don't know him personally. I think the media that's, is garbage. Huh? I think the media is overtly racist and trash. I think they employ some of the most vile racists. Oh, now, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying all media? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, no. Well, no, it's like no. this Council <laughs> on Foreign Relations you're, you're, media. You're the media. You're the media. I'm yeah, for sure. I'm not calling you a racist. I don't think everybody here is racist. No, I, you know, I'm I'm just so disdainful of corporate press. So we usually, the colloquial the, definition so is of everybody the media. So is everybody at Time Magazine responsible for that? Yes. Really? Oh, I'm not going to swear. Even, even the peons? Yes. No. Not yep. the cheap workers. It's some nope. some brainchild. If you guys listen to this show, you know my position on all of this. If you stand beneath the infrastructure holding it up as they do things that are wrong and you know they're doing it wrong, I will hold you responsible. You know the Chinese have this term called bite swa, which means white liberal. Like that's a white oh, left. White left, yeah, white which left. is inherently, I feel like a lot of this racism is being seeded. Like it didn't, up until, I'm not saying it didn't exist, but in like the early 2000s, it felt like there was a, we were coming together. It felt mm. like it. I felt like it. Did you feel like it in that? You know, I, I see progress all the time, okay? I think right now, right now, uh, there are people who would disagree with me, but I would say right now is one of the best times in our country, even though we're so divided, all right? Because uh, the wool is being pulled back. The carpet is being pulled back, and we're seeing all the dirt. People are, are saying how they feel, what they're thinking, et cetera. It's, it's hard to address something when people are hiding in the closet or hiding behind a smile and a stab you in the back. Right now, people are expressing their views. It's very divisive, but this is the best time because now we know what people are thinking. We know how to address them rather than be a, 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 a what do you call it, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, YouTube yeah. literally just deleted all of the Super Chats. Oh. Yep. No, no kidding. The only ones that are up are the ones that are in the active chat, so I'll see what I can... Um... Whoa. How did I delete them? No, no, no. YouTube, YouTube just did. just went. They were, they were probably like, too racist. Has that ever happened to you before? No. Wow. Yeah. What happened? So the the paid comments where people were asking questions just crashed. They're gone. Why? I don't know. Oh. I've never seen. It. I'll I'll just say it was a browser error, I suppose. But you I'm know. still I'm still seeing them come in. I can see them come in, and I can see the ones yeah, that are over the chat, ones. but I can't see um any of the other ones. And I don't, I don't know how much more more time we have. Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot. I got to go out of town tonight. All right, all right. Nice. So, um, sorry guys, YouTube just nuked your super chats. Uh, I suppose we'll just read a couple more. But uh, I think people are unhappy with uh, your views. Just, just. Well, you know what? People have been unhappy with my views for four hundred years. So I'll so, read this. You know, Black Rock Beacon says Daryl is done. He has abandoned nuance and critical thinking and has become emotionally defensive and lost empathy. He is literally starting to rant when pressed with logical arguments. This, He's entitled to his opinion, and that's fine. I think that people need to recognize that the conversation is happening and everyone's in a different spot on it. And Daryl is extremely pro-free speech, vastly more than many people sort of in the critical race theory realm. And that... I absolutely appreciate that. And a lot of people won't come on this show to talk. So that matters. Someone just mentioned that the, 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 the chat was gone too. Oh, it's bad. I'm watching it live right now. So Did you see the chat disappear it. at all? No. Someone said YouTube wiped the whole chat, not just super chats. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this kind, of, this kind of conversation is hot. 
I mean, that's the reason why it's not everyone does. It. And this is why it's good because now <laughs> people like this guy criticizing me is free to express his view. I'm, I'm free to express my view. He can think whatever he wants to think about me. I'm fine with that. I, I I've been you know called every name in the book, and you know I've been called every name but my own, and that's fine. Okay, he's he's entitled to his views. I'm entitled to my views. Okay, and uh, you know like like you guys never saw those pictures before. Why is that? We're you know, too young. No, not, well, because I'm not. Not, not because you're too I young, like because seven. you haven't done the research. They're there. They're there. Well, well, Go back and connect the dots, Tim. You know, you're, you're talking from a bubble, man. You're not talking from the past moving gap. forward. A gap, exactly. Yeah. So, so we got to bridge that gap, and that's why I'm here but to I, connect I, some I, dots for you as to why I've arrived at this point. Right, right. So I think the issue we experience is that the world and uh, the information we consume as millennials is so vastly different from yours that we see it's literally two different universes. But you know what? Figuratively. You are, you are yeah. here. Figuratively different universes. Whatever universe you're in is because of the universe from which it came. But you don't look back to see where you came from. I mean, this I do. That's a good point about censorship. just because censorship. I didn't know of the one story doesn't mean I talking don't Talking about his history. story. You're talking about history. His story. Like, who's, right. who's controlling his story? Who's writing it? So, I like so your idea, Bill, I've got about a, freedom I've got a, a Life uh, magazine from 1944 mm -hmm. that I picked up at an antique shop. Mm -hmm. And I've also got one from the 1950s. And I think it's got, uh, who's on the cover? Is it well, Nixon? Winston Churchill. Yeah. Nixon mm -hmm. doing a peace sign for a big crowd. And it's talking about the civil rights movement. It's fascinating to read the 1944, uh, it was March, just before D-Day, a couple months. And the explanation for why U.S. forces were in Britain is like laughable. It's like, well, now we know. But when you read stuff in the past, it's amazing what people thought about this stuff, how information was being withheld. But I think what's happening is for most of the people who watch, they're, they're, are, 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 the bulk of our viewership, like 60, 70 percent, are between 18 and 35. So the news that they're reading is rapid and they've probably heard everything you've mentioned. No. It's, but it, but I it, doubt that. Well, when you have when you, when you live in the digital world and it's and it's and they it's have access to everything. A hundred thousand tweets every single day that you're you're being slammed by. Mm -hmm. It's very different. So I think you know we see it with Bill Maher. We've seen it with with our other uh, guests who are in the Boober generation. That the 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 rate of information consumption for the older generation is substantially slower based on just the the traditional information gathering practices of the previous generation relative to today. So. These younger people right now, as you're saying it, are Googling it in real time. Mm -hmm. And they're commenting, saying you're wrong about this. And so that's one of, the, one of the challenges we have, why we have to be walking on ice and making sure we're doing the best, is that the, the 50,000 people concurrently watching at any moment are all sending the real-time fact check because they can research exactly what we say. Mm -hmm. So most of these people— now, now, as far as them telling me that I'm wrong, I don't believe that they are— Factual. They're telling me that they that I'm wrong based upon their opinion and what they think about what I'm saying. That's fair. But like a good example is the Kimberly Crenshaw thing, mm -hmm. who explicitly wrote that race, Marxism, and all that stuff. Now, I don't have a laptop in front of me, okay? But I can send you a link to to Kimberly Crenshaw talking about what she means by critical race theory and the same argument that you gave that she uh, uh, refutes. I mean, it's and, in her and book. I, I will send you that link. Like I just read her book. I read, I read the first, the, so I read what? the introduction to her book. So what? You know, I mean, I, I, if she, I, if I she recanted her book, I mean, that'd be fantastic. We could talk Listen, about it. I don't know if she recanted her book. I know what she said on live interview. Okay, you can see her talking. Okay, yeah. People, people say, you know, listen. People have done interviews with me, and and have gotten it wrong. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um. For example, I, I won't, I won't name the school. Uh, a very famous uh, university hired me to come do a lecture, all right? And this guy uh, called me before the lecture and wanted to know if he could interview me before I, before I came, well, when I came down before I gave the lecture from the student paper. I said, sure. I said, but are you going to stay for the lecture? Because I want you to see the lecture as, as well, and then you can interview me after as well. He said, okay. So... He, um, he, he interviewed me when I came down to, to, the, uh, to the university. Good guy, good lecture, I mean, good, good uh, interview. And, and he stuck around, watched the lecture, asked me a few questions afterwards. The next day, headline in this famous university paper, uh, first black member of the Ku Klux Klan speaks on campus. Now, he did not write that, that caption, that headline. 
that was done by the editor of the paper or whatever, you know. The, the campus had an uproar and they had to make them, you know, make a retraction. There are no black members of the Klan. If there were black members of the Klan, there wouldn't be a damn Klan, okay? But, you know, people get things wrong in writing. I can show you a link of her talking. Now, whether she wrote it in the book and then changed her mind or whether the book got it wrong or whatever, I, I will send you a link to her talking, answering the exact question that you said, which is opposite of what uh, the other guy says, Kendi or whatever. I do is. think I've I watched her give a... Uh, uh... A She's statement. given several interviews, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, I'm I don't... pretty sure I've seen a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. I suppose the issue is just um, what she wrote in her books versus you know, what she says listen, today may be different. Listen, George Wallace. Do you know who he is? Oh yeah. Okay, and you know what he did? He uh, school segregation and right. all that stuff. Segregation today, tomorrow, yep. and forever. Yep. Stood in the in the door, wouldn't let the uh, the black kids come in. Yep. National Guard had to come and pull him out of right. the door. Okay, he got shot. I watched him get shot. Wow. I watched him get shot on live TV. Okay, uh, the the, uh, the the news was covering his speech. Uh, he, he was in a town called Laurel, Maryland. All right, over in Prince George's County, and he was in the parking lot giving a speech. There were some black guys in the back of the crowd, and a bunch of white people up front. And he was giving his you know racist speech, and um, all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. Right on live TV, he got shot. Everybody turned and looked at the black people. It was a white guy up front named Arthur Bremer who shot uh, George Wallace, okay? Uh, Arthur Bremer just got out of prison a couple years ago. Anyway, he went to Hagerstown Prison. Um, later, George Wallace spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair as a result of that shooting. From the wheelchair, he said he was wrong. He changed his his racist attitude. Now, most people don't remember that. They remember him, segregation today, tomorrow, forever. You know, they remember the negative stuff, but they don't remember that Wallace changed his tune. So I will just say I I uh I think it's it's funny you mentioned everyone looked at the black people, but it was a white guy. Cause you know why, don't you? They assumed the people who were mad at him were probably black. Exactly. But the funny thing is, today, when it comes to issues of critical race theory, it is white, it is white people who are advocating this mostly. And that may be a, 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 the fact that white people are the majority of this country, so you'll see more white people advocating for critical race theory. But typically, a lot of these progressive ideologies like gender ideology or race ideology come from white liberals. It's also, you say, more white people advocating for critical race theory. It's also more white people advocating to ban critical race theory. Yeah, I think one of the issues is that people are confused and they're not arguing the exactly. same thing. Exactly, that's my whole point. There are so many different definitions of it. You know, right. you have yours. Crenshaw has hers. Kendi has his. What's that lady's name? Robin somebody. Yeah, she has hers. I think critical race praxis should be banned the same as Christian Christian praxis should be banned. We shouldn't be putting ideology in our curriculum, but we can teach about what the ideology is. So the issue is, like, if a Florida school said, Jesus died, and on the third day he rose again. If a day has 24 hours, how many hours was it until Jesus rose again? I'd be like, yo, that, that should not be in a math book, right? Is it, would, you, would you think that's appropriate for a public school math, math problem? Um, well, you got to understand something. When I grew up and was going to school, first thing we did in class was stand up and pray and say, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. You would pray as well? Yeah. Yeah, we all said a prayer. But 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 based on today's standards in which we don't allow prayer in public schools, I mean, do you think prayer should be in public schools? I think so. Oh, okay. And, however, I think people, um, if it depends upon the classroom, okay? If, if there's an Islam, uh, a Muslim person in the classroom, and there's a Jewish person, and there's a Christian person or Hindu person, I think they each should say a prayer. Someone, if, some, if someone is an atheist, then they can, they can opt to leave the room or, or remain seated. Or do whatever they want to do. Chris, you know, they, they should be respected as well. Have no thought. Chris H. just said Congress officially apologized for slavery in 2008. No. They didn't? No. You want to look it up, somebody? Yeah, what was the uh, statement? Congress officially apologized for slavery in 2008. Yeah, but uh, were they legit? Let's find out first. Oh. Official uh, apology. It, I think we've gone way long. I know you got to go, yeah. and we got to wrap. So I'm going to read. Just We'll, we'll just read one more. Uh, we'll read two more, actually. The first one will come from uh, Malty, who says, As a black man, I disagree with quite a bit of what Daryl said, but I will forever respect this man's action, better than any Antifa thug has done. 
And then there is, there's another really good one that we need to read because it's the most important one. Where did it go? Oh, there we go. Andrew Lance says, thank you, Daryl. This has been a really good conversation that reminds me of many I have had with various black friends I've known. I think people, uh, I just got to say for everybody who watches or listens to this show, we are trying to have more discussions over ideas that we disagree with. We're trying to make more of that. We're, I, I, that we, we routinely invite people on the left or progressive or whatever. They just don't want to come on the show. Some are, and we have a few booked, and um, it's good to have these conversations. So, Well, you know, I want to say this as well. You know, I, I, I appreciate everybody who, who has put in their chat, whether I agree with them or not, whether I call them a racist or not. I appreciate they're expressing their viewpoints, okay? And I think we should have more of these discussions. So I hope we can do that. Now, to your point about these people who are on the left or whatever who don't want to come, um, I was invited a couple years ago to this, this lady called me up. She's a sociologist professor. And um, she wanted to know what I consider coming to a, uh, a, a dinner gathering uh, with some people on the left and some people on the right. And she named um, a few uh, white supremacists, uh, one being uh, Richard Spencer. And um, I said, sure. So, uh, you know, they, they didn't r reveal where the dinner was to be held until the day of. And because uh, they wanted to keep it secret or whatever. So on the day of, I got, I got the email as to what address to come to, et cetera, et cetera, what time. And I showed up, and there were all these people over there on the right, Richard Spencer, some other neo-Nazi type people, and this, that, and the other, and we had dinner together. No one from the left but me showed up. And, you know, they, they, they backed out at the last minute. That's exactly now, what happens. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not one of those who back out. I will, I will stand up to anybody and everybody. And you're welcome to agree with me. You're welcome to disagree with me. But let's have the conversation. I agree, man. You know, and it, I appreciate you having me on the show. Oh, I appreciate you coming, man. I thought this was fantastic. Uh, we, you know, if people don't get along, or if people disagree, or even if, if they agree, I think we most, I think we agree on a lot more than we disagree. And I think we just highlighted disagreements because we disagree. We want to express those the most. You know, I think often the conversations we have in agreement, it's like, well, yeah, of course we agree on those things. But so then let's we, move on to the other things we don't agree. Right, right exactly, exactly. Let's get hot. So considering we've gone way too late tonight. Hey, oh, I want to point out you were right. Uh, Congress apologizes for slavery. There's a lot of NPR stuff from 2008. Apparently the U.S. House of Representatives issued an unprecedented apology to black Americans for the institution of slavery and the subsequent Jim Crow laws for years of discrimination. Uh, Steve Cohen, Democrat from Tennessee, drafted the resolution. Now, to be honest, my personal opinion platitudes uh, you want real a real apology is fixing the system well, how but, do you do but that? thank you for at least uh, do a, putting forth an official apology congress at some point i don't i didn't here's what we got to do yet. so everyone is actually saying you know who do we have to bribe to have you have a conversation with thomas sowell which would be oh that'd be amazing so cool. i don't know if that's if we can make it happen. Try. of course we can all right you know, <laughs> Th Th thomas sowell uh john mcwater oh yeah a lot of other Holman. people you know they have their opinions some I agree with, some I don't agree with. It doesn't make them right. No, it doesn't make me wrong. It doesn't make me right, or right and them wrong or whatever. I, I, I think people would just love to see you know, the, the intellectual uh, clash, as it were, like the, the, the ideas presented. Yeah, I know. People, maybe people, we'll people, do that people, this people, summer. Listen, listen, people, <laughs> listen, people, In people, June. People get a kick out of seeing black people fight each other for whatever reason. Mm. White people get a kick out of that, okay? I, I, I'm telling you all, get the movie. Go on, uh, it used to be on Netflix, it's not on there anymore, Amazon Prime or iTunes, okay? It's called Accidental Courtesy. And they followed me around the country when I was interviewing KKK and neo-Nazis, etc. And they, they, they set me up to interview some people, uh, a, a faction of uh, Black Lives Matter. And there was a major clash between me and Black Lives Matter. It happened at our event? And um, yeah. Uh, but but you, you're going to see this on film. And you're going to see about eight minutes. This went on for about an hour, and it almost erupted into violence. Wow. Okay? Take a look at that. You know, they, they did not respect, you know, what I stood for, what I did, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a year later, they reached out to me and said, you know, we've been seeing you. We've been reading some interviews. You know, you know we, we sort of get what you're doing. You know, you know we want to try to work together. You know, we don't agree with everything, but we think, you know, we can find some, you know, common ground. So we met and we had dinner and we started working together 
and then one of them fell off the wagon and reverted back to himself in, you know, in the film. But you will, you will see, uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the whole movie, the whole movie, uh, everybody talks about that particular scene because for whatever reason, now you're going to call me a racist again, and that's fine if you want to call me that. A lot of white people try to put black people in one box. We are not monolithic. We are as individual as white people, okay? Um, just like, you know, people say, well, you know, your, 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 your black leaders, you know, should do this and do that. Who are my black leaders? You know, is it Sharpton? Is it Jesse yeah. Jackson? Is it Obama? Is it Thomas Sowell? Is it John McWhorter? I mean, who, who are my black leaders? I hope it's who, not Farrakhan. Who, who, are, <laughs> yeah. who, who, who are your white leaders? Is it Donald Trump? Is it is the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Obama. Klan? I'm my own. It's leader. Obama. Exa well, exactly. You know, you have you have all your own people. You know, your leader might be different than his leader than his leader. So, well, you know, we don't we don't have white leaders. People, we had an orange leader for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, technically. Yeah, well, he thinks he's still the leader. <laughs> now let's get specific about he, he skin tone color. He thinks he's still. <laughs> well, you know what? The best thing that I saw. You know, I, I I'm I'm still doing this. I still go to Klan rallies and and all kinds of all that kind of stuff. But one of the best things I saw, I went to a Klan rally. And it, it was it was held on the lawn of the governor's mansion, all right, and um, in in the state capitol, and um, there are all these protesters and all the state police keeping the protesters at a distance from the the people in the robes and hoods. Well, these people showed up who had painted themselves green, and they were yelling "Green power! Green power!" That was the best thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, because I'm kind of pink. Your skin tone's a little <laughs> auburn. Yeah, yeah. Now All I right. like the specifics. Now we're nuanced. We are. We are. We went way late for a Friday, but it was really good. Daryl, this was fantastic. Thank you, for Thank you so me, much man. for coming. It. Hopefully, uh, you invite me back. Not everybody. Not, not everybody uh, liked the show, but it's all right. Eighty-eight percent liked the show, <laughs> and um, I, I, I think people should expect two things. We are going to have conversations with uh, over like that will disagree on. People will not agree, and I am not a master debater. I am not a debater, <laughs> but you know we'll have conversations. And so, if the issue is you feel like I don't do a good enough job, well, maybe we should actually do like what we did with Charlie Kirk and, and Vosh, and we'll have people who actually have you know want to have a debate, have a debate here. But don't expect me; I'm not that kind of guy, right? So, uh, if you do like the show and you appreciate that we're, we're doing our best, I thank you so much for watching. And if you don't like it, thanks for watching anyway. You're entitled to your opinions and we respect all of your comments and everything. Head over to TimCast.com if you want to support the show and support our journalists. You can follow the show at TimCast.IRL. You can follow me at TimCast. Daryl, do you want to shout anything out? Hey, really appreciate everybody. You can find me at DarylDavis.com. D-A-R-O-Y-L. One R at Davis.com. Right on. And thank you for attending. Hope, hope we can come back sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill. Find me at minds.com slash Ottman. All right. I'm Ian Crossland, and I love you guys. Thank you for coming. Everybody, Tim, you're great, man. This is really cool. Love y'all. And uh, wait, one more time, your documentary, the name of it? Accidental Courtesy. Accidental Courtesy. Yeah, and where's find the... it. Look, at, look for it on iTunes or Amazon Prime. Beautiful. And thank you guys very much for tuning in. It's been a very engaging conversation, a lot of fun. I always love sparring conversations like this, and I'm really glad that we went long this evening. It's, it's always more interesting. It's way more interesting to have someone you don't agree with fully on uh, any one thing. Anyway, you guys can follow me on Twitter and Minds.com at Sarah Patchlitz. One last shout out. Colin Stevens said, Tim, get Thomas Sowell and Clarence Thomas on. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> that would me, be one of the that. greatest shows <laughs> ever for any podcast at any point ever. I would love that for that to happen. Well, I'll, I'll throw some coins into a wishing well and see yes. if they can make it happen. Thanks for hanging out, everybody, and we'll see you all next time. Wait, wait, wait. Is it too late? No, okay. No. Go to Chicken City. <laughs> They're watch Chicken Sleeping. Uh, YouTube, chickencitylive.com. All right, we'll see you later. Bye, guys.